Zugeschaltet ist jetzt der CDU-Politiker Roderich Kiesewetter. Er ist Mitglied im Auswärtigen Ausschuss. Ich grüße Sie, Herr Kiesewetter. Guten Morgen, Herr Simon. Wie bewerten Sie denn den Umstand, dass Moskau jetzt das Getreideabkommen mit der Ukraine blockiert? In den ärmeren Regionen der Welt sind dadurch ja erneut Millionen Menschen durch Hunger ganz akut bedroht. Um, how significant is the fact that Russia is now going back on this important deal? And just explain why this deal was so important. Schon als Russland die Krim annektiert hat, protestierte der ukrainische Regisseur Oleg Sensov öffentlich dagegen und bezahlte dafür jahrelang einen sehr hohen Preis in einem russischen Straflager. TTT hat damals über ihn berichtet. Jetzt kommt der neueste Film des Sacharow-Preisträgers in unsere Kinos, Rino. Gedreht hatte ihn noch vor Putins jüngstem Überfall auf sein Heimatland. Weltpremiere war bereits letztes Jahr bei den Filmfestspielen in Venedig. Dear Ukrainians, on October 29th we managed to return another 52 people from Russian captivity, 50 of our defenders and two civilians. Among them are soldiers of the National Guard, the Navy, Border Guards and Security Forces. Energieversorgung ist das politische Thema der Stunde. Gerade jetzt vor dem Winter. Wladimir Putin setzt konventionelle Waffen gegen die Ukraine ein und politische Waffen gegen die EU. Stichwort Energieabhängigkeit. Experten rechnen Putin auch die Sabotageakte an den Gasleitungen in der Ostsee zu. Aber Anschläge auf wichtige Versorgungseinrichtungen gab es schon vorher und wird es wohl auch in Zukunft geben. Es gibt eine aktuelle Umfrage in Deutschland, wonach 80 Prozent der Deutschen Sorgen haben, dass dieser Krieg sich auf NATO-Gebiet ausweitet. Nehmen Sie diese German Angst, so wird das ja oft genannt, auch in Gesprächen mit Politikern wahr, mit der Bundesregierung wahr? Так, ми відчуваємо. Це правильна постановка питання, але ви знаєте, з іншого боку, ми розуміємо ja, auch wir spüren diese Angst. Einerseits verstehen wir natürlich, dass die Menschen an ihren Alltag im Frieden gewöhnt sind, dass bei ihnen das Völkerrecht gilt und Krieg natürlich immer böse ist. Die Deutschen haben ein Recht auf Angst. So, what was your reaction to this um, accusation from Russia? Well, I think it's a, it's a sign of the desperation that, uh, that Putin's regime has got because of the the shambles of their illegal invasion of Ukraine and how wrong it's gone, what a terrible mistake it was. And if it wasn't for the fact that all of these issues are so serious, it's actually laughable. One could almost laugh at him about it. It's a, the most ridiculous claim. What this war in Europe has shown us, it's bloody, vicious, and at the end of the day, it comes down to the infantrymen on the ground. So we're going to have to invest more in our land forces who have been woefully underinvested in in the last 10 to 15 yeah. years to make sure that we can play our role in NATO in future deployments deterring future Russian aggression. Russia says it has completed its call-up of 300,000 military reservists. Defense Minister Sergei Shoigu says over 80,000 reserve troops have already been deployed to Ukraine, with the rest still in training. President Vladimir Putin issued the mobilization order last month to beef up Russian forces in Ukraine. Now, following the daring drone attack on its Black Sea fleet, Russia has now suspended its participation in the United Nations brokered grain deal. And this has reversed months of diplomatic efforts that were aimed at ensuring food security in the world's poorest regions. The war in Ukraine entered a new phase in which drone warfare plays center stage. Can Ukraine successfully repel the wave of Iranian drones launched by Russian forces? What does the Sevastopol drone attack tell us about Ukrainian capabilities in this regard? Our guest today is Dr. Mateusz Piątkowski, specialist in the field of international law and aerial warfare from the University of Łódź in Poland. Resolution where we have, through a military, a diplomatic, a security effects, made it abundantly clear to Putin that he cannot prevail in Ukraine militarily, might force him um, at least into um, uh, 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 finally abandoning his um, ambitions to um, stop, you know, stop Ukraine being a country, which is what it wants. That that is phase one, and, and we are not there yet. 
Welcome to our program and uh, today I welcome my guest. Uh, it's Natalie Tocci, it's a political scientist and director of the Instituto Fari Internazionali at Vienna. The, Am I right? That Am I is correct? in Rome, in Rome, but in Rome. it's perfectly pronounced. So okay. I'm very impressed. Okay, I tried before, <laughs> so I tested myself. Zugeschaltet ist jetzt der CDU-Politiker Roderich Kiesewetter. Er ist Mitglied im Auswärtigen Ausschuss. Ich grüße Sie, Herr Kiesewetter. Guten Morgen, Herr Simon. Wie bewerten Sie denn den Umstand, dass Moskau jetzt das Getreideabkommen mit der Ukraine blockiert? In den ärmeren Regionen der Welt sind dadurch ja erneut Millionen Menschen durch Hunger ganz akut bedroht. Ja, das gilt es schon ein bisschen anders einzuordnen, als wir das landläufig in Deutschland so wahrnehmen. Dieses Getreideabkommen war ja bereits einen Tag, nachdem es abgeschlossen war, schon gefährdet, indem Russland die Getreideausgabestellen in Odessa zerstört hat, also die ukrainischen Getreideausgabestellen. Und Putin ja bewusst auf die Begrenzung von vier Monaten gesetzt hat, also bis November. Wir haben in wenigen Tagen November. Das heißt also, er beendet es bewusst auch mit der damals schon gesetzten Grenze. Zweitens, das Ziel dieser Getreidesanktionen, die Russland ja ausgesprochen hat, ist, Folgemigration zu erzeugen. Das ist ganz klar in Kauf genommen, dass aus Ländern des Balkans, des nördlichen Afrikas, dass dort die Staaten nicht ausreichend Geld haben, um sich Düngemittel und Getreide zu kaufen. Dadurch entstehen Ausweichkosten und damit äh, womöglich weitere Migration, die Putin massiv in Kauf nimmt. Also es ist Teil seiner Strategie. Es ist keine Überraschung. Äh, wir sollten uns darauf einstellen, dass allerdings noch weitere Überraschungen äh, in unserer herkömmlichen äh, Haltung entstehen werden. Also Folgemigration ist ein ganz klarer Punkt. Und das ist etwas, was wir einpreisen müssen. Sie sagen, Sie sind da jetzt nicht wirklich überrascht. Man konnte ja auch vorher schon seit über einer Woche, vielleicht sogar noch länger, beobachten, dass am Bosporus die leeren Frachter, die zurück zur Ukraine fahren sollten, ganz bewusst blockiert worden sind, weil die russischen Kontrolleure das einfach nicht zugelassen haben. Waren das schon die ersten Anzeichen? Ja, das ist ja das eine. Und das andere ist, dass etwa zwei Millionen Tonnen im Stau stehen, weil sie auch nicht ausfahren können. Über 190 Schiffe stehen im Stau zum Rausfahren und ein Großteil auch wieder bei der Rückfahrt. Also das ist langsam vorbereitet und passt zur russischen Strategie. Parallel wird ja in der Ukraine massiv Infrastruktur zerstört vom 10. bis 20. Oktober ein Drittel aller Elektrizitätswerke, sodass also auch bewusst in der Ukraine weiter Druck für Migration erzeugt wird, das verhindert wird, dass Menschen zurückkehren. Das passt ins Gesamtkonzert. Wir müssen uns weiter darauf einstellen, dass Russland diesen Krieg nicht ausschließlich militärisch gegen die Ukraine sieht, sondern dass sie ganz breit sich aufstellen. Wir nennen das hybride Kriegsführung, also auch Informationskrieg, aber eben auch die Frage der Nahrungsmittel, der Düngungsmittel. Und die Düngemittel hat ja Putin selbst im September letzten Jahres extrem verteuern lassen, indem er beispielsweise Weißrussland den Export verboten hat. Also es passt in die Gesamtstrategie. Wir müssen nur anders antworten. Wir brauchen eine andere politische Kommunikation. Und deshalb ist auch gut, dass die Bundesregierung Generation, Generatoren liefert. Aber wir müssen uns auch darauf einstellen, dass wir im nördlichen Afrika auf dem Balkan vermutlich für mehr Lebensmittellieferungen sorgen müssen und Russland noch weiter sanktionieren. Eine weitere Reaktion schlägt der ukrainische Präsident Zelensky vor. Der fordert nämlich, dass man Russland jetzt aus den G20 rauswerfen sollte. Hätte ein solcher Vorschlag denn Aussicht auf Erfolg? Simon, das wird nicht möglich sein. Wir müssen auch aufpassen, dass die Ukraine keine unrealistischen Forderungen stellt. Es ist völlig nachvollziehbar. Die russische Föderation gehört geächtet. Sie zerstört das Weltmiteinander. Aber in den G20 sind auch Staaten wie China oder Indien und die werden einen Ausschluss eben zu verhindern wissen. Und deshalb ist es viel wichtiger, den Druck auf Russland zu erhöhen, es weiter zu isolieren und auch die ganzen Fake-Botschaften zu entlarven. Und da erwarte ich mir von unserer Bundesregierung deutlich mehr Kommunikation. Ich will nur eine Zahl nennen. Für unsere Bevölkerung werden knapp 300 Milliarden Euro ausgegeben, um den Zusammenhalt zu ermöglichen, die sozialen Härten abzufedern. Und wir geben nur ein Prozent für die Ukraine aus. Drei Milliarden Euro geben wir aus, um der Ukraine mit Waffenlieferungen und anderen Hilfen 
äh, an der Seite zu stehen. Im vergleichbaren Zeitraum äh, seit Kriegsbeginn haben wir 12 Milliarden Euro an Russland überwiesen für Energielieferungen. Die sind jetzt gestoppt. Aber es gilt unserer Bevölkerung mehr zu erklären, dass dies ein Krieg gegen uns alle ist und der nicht nur militärisch geführt wird. Sagt Roderich Kiesewetter von der CDU. Vielen Dank für das Gespräch. Dankeschön. Um, how significant is the fact that Russia is now going back on this important deal? And just explain why this deal was so important. So the deal is, is, is vitally important to Ukraine because of its economy. And it's vitally important to really tortured places in the world like Somalia and, and Libya and many other places in Africa. For example, just the 170 ships at sea at the minute that are going to be caught up by this Russian change of direction will carry enough food for seven million people for a while. So the first reason this really matters is that uh, at stake is the welfare of millions of people in parts of the world that are nothing to do, frankly, with this with this war. And just talk to us about the the, the concept of this fictitious terror um, attack, because um, there was a Russian naval base that was hit by a, a drone attack. Do you think that was the Russians that did it? And then they're saying that it was Ukraine that did it, which gives them the, the excuse for pulling out of this um, deal. So it's really very, very difficult to be sure. that The video footage shows ships being attacked by drones that fly and also reports of, of maritime drones, drones that, that travel on or under the water. Whether Russia would really do that to itself it isn't clear. It's, it has done it in the past. But we've also seen Ukraine being capable of attacking targets in Crimea, and this is the naval base in Crimea, because uh, let's be absolutely clear that the ships in the Black Sea fleet that are attacked carry the caliber cruise missiles that are being used to target, amongst other things, the Ukrainian electrical infrastructure. So it could be the Ukrainians? It could be or it could be the Russians, but I think it's better to see this in the context of the of the three things that are going on right now in this war. First of all, on, on, the, on the battlefield, um, as the war goes into the winter after seven or eight very, very difficult uh, months, both sides are struggling to make uh, headway and both sides are facing what looks to me to be a very long, drawn out war well into next year and probably beyond. Secondly, Russia is doing everything it can to weaken the will of the Ukrainian people to continue the, the fighting, principally by, by, by bearing down on, on their electricity supply in the winter. And the third thing, and this is where the grain issue really comes in, is Russia is now doing everything it can to try and deplete the will, particularly of Western powers, to continue to support Ukraine by making our lives uh, difficult. And it's very interesting that in this attack, Russia cited help from British specialists to do it, which is which is clearly ridiculous, mm. but is an indication of how Russia's eye is turning to the supporters of Ukraine. And we shouldn't be surprised if we too get a bit of a tough time, whether it's in cyberspace or electricity generation or whatever it is in the coming weeks and months. And that very much follows on from the kind of ridiculous but very serious allegations made yesterday from the Russian Ministry of Defence saying that it was the British Navy that had destroyed the Nord Stream gas pipeline. I mean, should Britain be worried about this escalation in claims against us? Yes, we should, because we can be absolutely clear the story is is, is nonsense. The, the British Navy did not uh, disrupt or uh, the pipeline that supplies no in normal times gas from Russia to Germany. Of course we didn't. But when Russia says things like this, it, it's, it's not because it's just made them up and they have just made them up. It, it's, it's usually because it's going to justify something that, that happens now that, and that might be more cyber interference in our, in our infrastructure, citing the pipeline attack as justification. It might be the interruption of a gas supply from Norway about which there has been some uh, some some loose chatter. So we should take notice of what Russia says, not because it's true, 
but because of, of, of what it might herald mm. happening next. Right, I see what you mean. So it could be pitch ruling for something to, to come down the, the track. That's really interesting. Um, and so, Richard, while I've got you, so I just wanted to get um, your view on how serious you would be from a security point of view about these allegations that Liz Truss's phone was hacked uh, by people close to Russia and, and President um, Putin while she was foreign secretary. So first of all, no government minister, no official, frankly, no one who has a sensitive role in, in the commercial world should in these days be in any doubt at all that your personal mobile phone is a complete liability. It, it, if you put it in the wrong place, if you use it in the wrong way, of course it can be hacked. And if you are the Foreign Secretary or the Defence Secretary or indeed any government minister, your personal mobile will be of great interest to the intelligence services of powers that only wish us harm. And there are several of those. So it can come as no surprise that the phone was hacked. And, and this is why ministers and officials and others don't, should not use their personal mobiles for official business. They should assume their personal mobiles are in jeopardy. Schon als Russland die Krim annektiert hat, protestierte der ukrainische Regisseur Oleg Sensov öffentlich dagegen und bezahlte dafür jahrelang einen sehr hohen Preis in einem russischen Straflager. TTT hat damals über ihn berichtet. Jetzt kommt der neueste Film des Sacharow-Preisträgers in unsere Kinos. Rino, gedreht hatte ihn noch vor Putins jüngstem Überfall auf sein Heimatland. Weltpremiere war bereits letztes Jahr bei den Filmfestspielen in Venedig. Und es dürfte für absehbare Zeit das letzte Werk Sensovs gewesen sein, denn er, der die Glamourwelt des Films ebenso kennt wie die Hölle des Gulags, ist nun in der Welt des Krieges. Wir haben Kontakt mit ihm aufgenommen und gefragt, wie es ihm geht und mit was für eine Zukunft er rechnet. Oleg Sensov hat Fronturlaub. Der Regisseur ist jetzt Soldat, Sergeant in der Luftaufklärung der ukrainischen Armee. Aber auf seinem Sofa in Kiew zeigt er uns schon neue Drehbuchentwürfe mit Filmideen für die Zeit nach dem Krieg. Mein Leben hat sich schon oft gewendet. Ich habe viel erlebt. Jetzt macht meine Filmkarriere Pause und ich bin im Krieg. Und hier bleibe ich bis zum Sieg. Ohne Sieg wird es keine Ukraine, keine ukrainische Kultur und kein ukrainisches Kino geben. Jetzt sind Sie selbst ähm, ganz real im Krieg. Was ist das? Was bedeutet das für Sie? Wie geht es Ihnen damit? Der Krieg ist überhaupt nicht so, wie er in den Nachrichten gezeigt wird. Das sage ich Ihnen. Er ist schmutziger, banaler, langweiliger, komplizierter, länger. Aber der Mensch gewöhnt sich an alles, verstehen Sie? An die Beschüsse, den Tod, er wird zum Alltag. Krieg macht nichts. Sie schießen? Egal. Das Leben hat schon so oft versucht, mich zu brechen. Dieser Krieg ist für mich nicht schwer. Sensov ist dabei, vor neun Jahren, als die Ukrainer auf dem Maidan gegen die Janukowitsch-Regierung auf die Barrikaden gehen. 2014 protestiert er gegen die Annexion der Krim durch Russland, versorgt eingekesselte ukrainische Soldaten. 2015 verurteilt ihn ein Moskauer Gericht zu 20 Jahren Haft. Putin bezeichnet ihn öffentlich als Terrorist. Im Hungerstreik verliert Sensov beinahe sein Leben. Nach vier Jahren Straflager in Sibirien kommt er bei einem Gefangenenaustausch frei. Und jetzt Putins Vernichtungskrieg gegen Sensovs Heimatland. Er will die Ukraine als solche zerstören. Als Staat, als Nation, als Kulturraum, als alles. Das ist die typische Herangehensweise eines Imperiums gegenüber seinen Kolonien. Das passiert jetzt nicht, weil Putin sich das gerade in seinem Kopf so zurechtgelegt hat. Wir erleben die heiße Phase eines inzwischen achtjährigen Krieges gegen unsere Geschichte und Kultur, der im Grunde seit Jahrhunderten andauert. 
Es ist schon grotesk. Während der Regisseur Sensov als Soldat in der Ukraine für sein Land kämpft, kommt bei uns sein neuester Film in die Kinos. Rino. Nichts für schwache Nerven. Der Film ist roh und brutal. Es geht um einen jungen Mann, Rino, der immer tiefer ins ukrainische Gangstermilieu der 90er Jahre abrutscht und elend dafür bezahlt. Den Hauptdarsteller hat Regisseur Sensov wie einige der Laienschauspieler aus dem Hooligan-Milieu ausgesucht. So gewaltverliebt will man die Ukraine heute nicht sehen. Aber Rino zeigt eine Generation ohne Perspektive und ohne Werte nach dem Zusammenbruch der UdSSR. Dieser Film ist ein Versuch, in die eigene Vergangenheit zu schauen, um zu sehen, wo wir in der Ukraine vor 20 Jahren waren, in jenem hässlichen Abschnitt unserer Geschichte. Wir schauen beschämt zurück und freuen uns darüber, dass diese Zeit vorbei ist, dass wir einen riesigen Weg von einer postsowjetischen Kolonie Richtung Europa gegangen sind. Der Ukraine-Krieg hat diesen Prozess brutal gestoppt. Schulen wurden gezielt zerstört, Einkaufszentren, die Stromversorgung. Kann die Ukraine so überleben? Der Mensch hält sehr viel aus. Ich habe auch schon sehr viel aushalten müssen. Ich bleibe bis zum Schluss in diesem Krieg, bis zum Sieg, bis ich auf meine Krim zurückkehre. Bis mein Land befreit ist, bis Putin verhaftet oder vernichtet wird. Auf jeden Fall will ich das Ende dieses Diktators sehen. Für uns wird das der Sieg sein. Und danach werde ich zum Film zurückkehren. Hoffentlich bald. Ich gebe mir Mühe. Ich habe nicht vor, zu sterben. Thank you very much for you. Dear Ukrainians, on October 29th we managed to return another 52 people from Russian captivity, 50 of our defenders and two civilians. Among them are soldiers of the National Guard, the Navy, border guards and security forces. Andriy Albov is the head of the surgical department of the Mariupol Military Hospital. He was evacuated from Azovstal. Vasil Chalenko is a volunteer, security guard, commander of the reconnaissance platoon. Among these 52 are a sailor from Snake Island, as well as a National Guardsman who was taken prisoner while defending the Chernobyl nuclear power plant, and a pensioner who earlier worked in the security service of Ukraine and who was taken prisoner by the occupiers in Bucha. We remember all those held captive in Russia and in the occupied territory and will do everything to return each and every one. Our exchange team is always working. These are Budanov, Yermak, Usov, Lubinets and others who help. In total, since March, 1031 people have already been released from Russian captivity, thanks to the whole team for this result. I would like to once again commend the work of our energy workers, repairmen and regional administrations, all those who are working to restore the normal technical possibility of electricity supply after the Russian terrorist attacks. On October 29th, there are significantly fewer stabilization and emergency blackouts, much less. But there is still such a need, and in some cities and districts restrictions are still possible. In particular, it is Kirovograd region and some other regions. We do everything to make power outages as predictable as possible and so that people can plan their day. Special thanks to those who worked and are working to restore energy supply to the city of Uman and the Uman district of Cherkasy region. There was indeed a difficult situation after one of the Russian strikes. As of now, it is possible to return the technical possibility of power supply. The same situation is in Kyiv region. It was critical, but we are now changing it for the better. I want to emphasize, the return of the technical possibility of supply does not mean that the energy shortage in the system has been overcome. Russian terror continues. It is very cynical. Sometimes it repeatedly attacks deliberately when repairs have begun, when recovery work is in progress. Unfortunately, we have casualties in repair crews, in energy companies. My condolences to their families. Therefore, please, this applies to all Ukrainians. It is very important to be conscious of electricity consumption. This necessity 
persists. Now we all have to contribute to maintaining the stability of the entire power system. During the week from Saturday to Saturday, more than 40 Iranian strike drones, a significant number of Russian missiles, six attack helicopters of the occupiers, several of their planes were shot down. Such a result means hundreds of Ukrainian lives saved, dozens of critical infrastructure objects saved. And as proposed by the military command today, I want to especially note the Odessa and Kherson anti-aircraft missile brigades of the Air Force. Well done, guys! I also thank all our defenders of the sky, absolutely everyone, all anti-aircraft fighters, pilots, mobile fire groups, who are currently performing one of the most important strategic tasks, saving the country from airstrikes by terrorists. On October 29th, a rather predictable statement came from Russia, a statement that they are finally cancelling the grain export initiative. But in fact, this is not their decision today. Russia began deliberately aggravating the food crisis back in September when it blocked the movement of ships with our food. From September to today, 176 vessels have already accumulated in the Green Corridor, which cannot follow their route. Some grain carriers have been waiting for more than three weeks. This is an absolutely deliberate blockade by Russia. This is an absolutely transparent intention of Russia to return the threat of large-scale famine to Africa and Asia. Literally, on October 29th, more than 2 million tons of food are in the sea. This means that access to food has actually worsened for more than 7 million consumers. Algeria, Egypt, Yemen, Bangladesh, Vietnam, other countries, very different countries, from different parts of the world, but they can all be equally destabilized by this Russian decision to block exports. I emphasize, this decision was made by Russia apparently in September. Only this queue of ships with food at sea can testify to this. It is also important that Russia attacked our naval forces at least twice during the Grain Initiative, precisely by those forces that guarantee the safety of the Grain Corridor. A strong international response is needed now, both at the UN level and at other levels, in particular at the level of the G20. How can Russia be among the G20 if it is deliberately working for starvation on several continents? This is nonsense. Russia has no place in the G20. All partners see this artificial queue of vessels. They see what Russia did to disrupt the grain initiative. They see that even ships with grain, which are contracted within the framework of the UN food program for the poorest countries, do not get a guaranteed opportunity to pass through the sea route. Russia is doing everything to ensure that millions of Africans, millions of residents of the Middle East and South Asia find themselves in conditions of artificial famine or at least a severe price crisis. But why a handful of people somewhere in the Kremlin can decide whether people in Egypt or Bangladesh who have food on their tables? What is it? The world has the power to protect people against this. Ukraine has been and can continue to be one of the guarantors of global food security. Russian terror and blackmail must lose. Humanity must win. I think everyone who is fighting with us to restore peace and stability to international relations. I think everyone who fights and works for Ukraine. Glory to Ukraine. Energieversorgung ist das politische Thema der Stunde. Gerade jetzt vor dem Winter. Wladimir Putin setzt konventionelle Waffen gegen die Ukraine ein und politische Waffen gegen die EU. Stichwort Energieabhängigkeit. Experten rechnen Putin auch die Sabotageakte an den Gasleitungen in der Ostsee zu. Aber Anschläge auf wichtige Versorgungseinrichtungen gab es schon vorher und wird es wohl auch in Zukunft geben. Etwa auch durch Cyberangriffe kann die Energieversorgung ausgeschaltet werden. Umso mehr Tempo will die EU jetzt beim Schutz kritischer Infrastruktur machen. Ein Bericht von Fritz Jungmeier und Robert Sigmund. Bilder von russischen Raketenangriffen auf die Ukraine. Im Visier der Angreifer die kritische Infrastruktur. Seit Beginn des Überfalls lässt Wladimir Putin gezielt Eisenbahnstrecken, Bahnhöfe, Kraftwerke, Öllager, Stromleitungen, Straßen und Flugplätze bombardieren. Damit schwächt er die Wirtschaft der Ukraine weiter, zwingt mehr Menschen zur Flucht und erhöht den Druck auf die Europäische Union. Wirklich aufgeschreckt ist die EU aber erst durch einen sehr lauten und unhörbaren Knall 80 Meter unter dem Meeresspiegel und sichtbar geworden durch diese Gassprudel in der Ostsee. Vermutlich durch einen russischen Sabotageakt werden die beiden Gasleitungen Nord Stream 1 und Nord Stream 2 zerstört. 
Die Sabotageakte gegen die Pipelines haben gezeigt, wie verwundbar unsere Energieinfrastruktur ist. Zum ersten Mal in der jüngeren Geschichte ist sie zur Zielscheibe geworden, sagt Anfang Oktober vor dem Europäischen Parlament in Straßburg Kommissionspräsidentin Ursula von der Leyen. Jetzt soll alles ganz schnell gehen bei der Stärkung der Widerstandsfähigkeit kritischer Infrastruktur im Falle von Naturkatastrophen, Terroranschlägen und Sabotage. Doch was genau ist kritische Infrastruktur? Jeder weiß das ungefähr, nicht alle umfassend. Deshalb ist es so wichtig, klar zu definieren, was kritische Infrastruktur ist. Ich habe parlamentarisch beispielsweise die Lebensmittelketten eingebracht. Die müssen funktionieren, damit das Leben weitergehen kann. Und in der Vergangenheit war beispielsweise nicht einmal das Pipeline-Dasein, die Pipeline-Struktur als kritische Infrastruktur definiert. Nicht einmal Nord Stream, das er jetzt in aller Munde ist, war als kritische Infrastruktur definiert. Das geschieht jetzt. Und auf Basis geheimdienstlicher Informationen definiert man, woher die größten Gefahren drohen. Da hilft der sogenannte strategische Kompass. Das strategische Kompass, der äh, definiert zwar Putin Russland heute als größte Gefahr, äh, aufgrund des äh, auch konventionellen Krieges, wie wir ihn seit Februar erleben. Diese hybriden Angriffe gab es ja auch schon vorher. Aber den islamistischen Terror nach wie vor als sehr, sehr hoch angesetzte äh, Gefahr, da hat sich äh, gewissermaßen in der Reihenfolge der Risikokategorien ein bisschen was geändert, aber beides gehört nach wie vor zu den ganz großen Gefahrenszenarien. Die Angriffsfläche ist natürlich riesig, man wird nie alles schützen können, aber ein Kriterium ist zum Beispiel jedenfalls einmal, dass man die Stromversorgung aufrechterhält. Wir wissen, seit der Liberalisierung äh, des, des Stromnetzes ist die Gefahr eines, eines Blackouts vierfach höher, sagen Experten, als das vorher der Fall war. Und in Österreich gibt es Wissenschaftler, die davon ausgehen, dass dieser Blackout statt finden wird in den nächsten fünf Jahren. Und wenn man weiß, was für Folgen das hat, nämlich das wird einmal 12 bis 48 Stunden dauern, dass überhaupt dann das Netz wieder in Betrieb geht, dann weiß man, dass man das dringend verhindern muss und mit allen Mitteln, die wir haben. Die kritische Infrastruktur ist jedenfalls einmal die Versorgungslinien, also äh, sprich äh, Gaspipelines, Stromnetze, Kraftwerke, äh, äh, wichtige Internetverbindungen, also die Hochseekabeln und diese Dinge. Und ich würde auch auf jeden Fall dazu sagen, natürlich auch äh, Gesundheitsversorgung und was im Weiteren auch, auch dazugehört. Äh, da wissen wir auch seit Covid, dass wir da noch Lücken haben in, in der Versorgung. Aber die wichtigste Infrastruktur, die wir haben, ist auch unsere Demokratie. Und die gehört auch geschützt, nämlich im Sinne von, dass wir auch unsere Wahlen und die Demokratie von ausländischer Einflussnahme, von Cyberattacken und dergleichen auch in Zukunft besser schützen werden müssen. Was kritische Infrastruktur ist und besser geschützt werden muss, wird gerade im EU-Parlament angesichts der neuen Bedrohungslage durch Russland neu verhandelt. Auch Österreich muss sich der Herausforderung stellen. Hierzulande wird bis dato kritische Infrastruktur indirekt über das Strafgesetzbuch definiert. Laut § 74 betrifft kritische Infrastruktur Einrichtungen, Anlagen, Systeme oder Teile davon, die der Allgemeinheit zugänglich und dienlich sind. Die Eigentumsverhältnisse sind unbedeutend, auch private Anbieter zählen dazu. Das Strafgesetzbuch listet die Bereiche auf öffentliche Sicherheit, also Polizei, Zoll, Justizwache, Landesverteidigungseinrichtungen wie Kasernen und Flugplätze, Kommunikation und Information, da sind zu nennen Radio, Fernsehen, Post, Satelliten, Internetkabel, weiters Gesundheitsbereich, also Spitäler, Heime, Rettungsdienst, Apotheken, die öffentliche Versorgung, Kraftwerke, Leitungen, Raffinerien, Gasspeicher. Die Abfallentsorgung, Entsorgungszentren, Kläranlagen, Kanalisation und der öffentliche Verkehr, also Straßen, Schienen, Brücken, Bahnhöfe, Flughäfen. Seit 2008 ist die Richtlinie zur kritischen Infrastruktur in Kraft. EU-Parlament und EU-Kommission wollen sich ein Jahr Zeit geben, diese zu aktualisieren. Es sollen elf Risikobereiche abgedeckt werden, darunter Naturkatastrophen, Terroranschläge, interne Bedrohungen und Sabotage, aber auch Notfälle im Bereich der öffentlichen Gesundheit, wie die jüngste Corona-Pandemie schmerzlich aufgezeigt hat. 2024 soll das Gesetz zum Schutz kritischer Infrastruktur in Kraft treten und mithelfen, die Menschen in der EU vor einem Alltag wie derzeit in der Ukraine zu bewahren. Es gibt eine aktuelle Umfrage in Deutschland, wonach 80 Prozent der Deutschen Sorgen haben, dass dieser Krieg sich auf NATO-Gebiet ausweitet. Nehmen Sie diese German Angst 
so wird das ja oft genannt, auch in Gesprächen mit Politikern war, mit der Bundesregierung war? Так, ми відчуваємо. Це правильна постановка питання, але ви знаєте, з іншого боку, ми розуміємо, що люди, які звикли, знову ж таки, до певних умов існування... Ja, auch wir spüren diese Angst. Einerseits verstehen wir natürlich, dass die Menschen an ihren Alltag im Frieden gewöhnt sind, dass bei ihnen das Völkerrecht gilt und Krieg natürlich immer böse ist. Die Deutschen haben ein Recht auf Angst. Andererseits geht es für die Ukraine ums Überleben. Darum haben wir nach acht Monaten im Krieg keine Angst mehr. Russland wird sich erst dann anders verhalten, wenn sie auf ihren Platz verwiesen werden. Und wir sind bereit, jeden Preis für die Sicherheit von Europa zu bezahlen. Zahlen. Aber bitte helfen Sie uns mit Waffen. Es gab am Anfang die großen Diskussionen, dass Deutschland zu wenig Waffen liefert und viel zu langsam. Es kam jetzt immer mehr an in der Ukraine, zuletzt die IRIS-T-Systeme. Es gibt aber weiterhin die Weigerung von Deutschland, Panzer westlicher Bauart zu liefern, Leopard-Panzer, Marder-Schützenpanzer. Безумовно, ми наполегливо працюємо в цьому напрямку, і безумовно, у нас є певні успіхи. Я думаю, що з часом ми все ж таки знайдемо порозуміння. Ja, wir arbeiten weiter hart daran und haben auch Erfolge. Ich denke, dass wir für die Panzer bald einen Konsens mit unseren deutschen Partnern finden. Die Lieferung von Panzern, vor allem der Leopard, wäre aktuell sehr wichtig, weil dieser Krieg so intensiv ist und Russland eine große Menge an sowjetischen Waffen hat. Wir können doch nicht mithalten, wenn sie 10.000 Panzer haben und wir nur 100. Gerade Panzer sorgen für Beschleunigung und für die Befreiung von unseren Gebieten Kherson, Saporizhia und natürlich Luhansk und Donetsk. Und Deutschland könnte uns dabei mit Leopard und Marder-Panzern optimal helfen. Putin sagte am Donnerstag, dass der Westen früher oder später gezwungen sein werde, wieder an den Verhandlungstisch zu kommen. Sie haben Erfahrungen im März gemacht mit Verhandlungen mit Russland. Was muss aus Ihrer Sicht erfüllt sein? Was sind die Voraussetzungen dafür, dass Sie sagen, wir können wieder an den Tisch gehen? Na mi preveliki žal, zahidnije elite ne do kinca rozumiju čo taki Rosija. Leider verstehen westliche Eliten nicht ganz, wie Russland tickt. Schon oft tappten sie in die Falle, die der Kreml ihnen stellt. Russland hat niemals Verhandlungen vorgeschlagen. Russland hat immer nur verdeckte Ultimaten vorgeschlagen. Die Ukraine ist erst bereit für Verhandlungen, wenn das eigene Territorium befreit ist. Und dazu gehören der Donbass und die Krim. Alles andere ist inakzeptabel, denn das Ultimatum der Russen bedeutet nur die Fortsetzung des Krieges. Sie sagen immer wieder, wenn die Ukraine die richtigen Waffen bekommt, könnte dieser Krieg sehr schnell zu Ende gehen. Sie sagten kürzlich, der Krieg kann in einem Monat zu Ende sein. Wenn Sie das sagen, stelle ich mir immer die Frage, ich sehe im Grunde eine Lücke, weil Sie auslassen, dass Putin doch niemals eine totale Niederlage akzeptieren würde. Oder liege ich falsch? Ein sehr, sehr interessanter Punkt. Und ich kann Ihnen mit einem Satz antworten. Sie müssen endlich aufhören, Putin zu fürchten. Ich kann mich nur wiederholen, wenn wir Leopard-Panzer in angemessener Zahl erhalten, wenn wir MLRS-Systeme bekommen, wenn wir Luftabwehrsysteme und Antidrohnensysteme erhalten, um den Himmel zu schließen, dann können wir den russischen Genozid beenden und wir können die Zeit bis Putins Ende fast mathematisch berechnen. Чи антидронові системи, які дозволяють спокійно закрити небо, про що ми говорили, до речі, і шість місяців тому, для того, щоб Росія не вела геноцидну війну, то тоді ми з вами можемо чітко математично обрахувати, якого часу достатньо, щоб в Росії почались незворотні процеси. І ви нарешті забули прізвище Путіна як такого. Gleichzeitig frage ich mich, wenn Sie sagen, diese Gesellschaft will diesen Krieg bis zum Ende führen, ob das Land das auch kann, ob die Möglichkeiten da sind. Ich habe gerade gehört, dass Ihr Finanzminister gesagt hat, dass allein im nächsten Jahr, im kommenden Jahr, 3,5 Milliarden Euro pro Monat 
fehlen werden, die finanziert werden müssen. Macht Ihnen das Sorgen? Die Ukraine wird standhalten, selbst dann, wenn fast alles zerstört zu sein scheint. Russland tötet nicht nur unsere Leute, sondern vernichtet auch unsere Wirtschaft. Wir können diese Probleme nicht allein bewältigen, wenn unsere Wirtschaft ruiniert ist. Es gibt die Idee, dass man eingefrorene russische, russische Assets benutzt, um die Ukraine zu finanzieren, auch beim Wiederaufbau. Wie ist da der Stand und haben Sie darüber auch schon mit der deutschen Regierung gesprochen? Unterstützt die deutsche Regierung das? Wir sind ständig dazu in Beratungen, auch mit der Bundesregierung. Mindestens 330 Milliarden Dollar an russischen Assets sind eingefroren und es kommen immer neue Informationen hinzu. Wir sind in Gesprächen darüber, wie wir das Geld nach der heißen Phase des Kriegs verwenden können. Wir brauchen das Geld besonders für den Wiederaufbau der Wirtschaft des Landes und auch für die Erstattung aller im Krieg entstandenen Verluste. So what was your reaction to this um, accusation from Russia? Well, I think it's a, it's a sign of the desperation that uh, that Putin's regime has got because of the the shambles of their illegal invasion of Ukraine and how wrong it's gone, what a terrible mistake it was. And if it wasn't for the fact that all of these issues are so serious, it's actually laughable. One could almost laugh at him about it. It's a, the most ridiculous claim. But uh, it's It's, it's typical of some of the comments that have been made. It's muddying the water, throwing out all sorts of false accusations. And one could sort of see a, a pernicious plot, possibly, um, to see it as a way of, uh, of making allowances for anything they might do to cables under uh, the area of our economic zone, for example. You know, for example, the, 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 you know, what happened to that cable going to the Shetland Islands? I... I There was a Russian ship around at that stage and, you know, it's muddying the waters. And, and what I do find extraordinary is it actually is a, a precise claim against a country. I don't think there's been another one like this actually pointing to, I mean, effectively they're pointing to the United Kingdom and the Royal Navy specifically. And the other things have been much more generalizations or tied very much to Ukraine, like the business of a dirty bomb, which you could see as possibly a precursor to them doing something there. So, so I think it's worrying, but, uh, but it, is, it is a laughable nonsense. Mm. And I think historically looking at it, I mean, you know, Putin loves maritime affairs. I think his father was involved with the Navy. Uh, and I remember some um, 17 years ago, being in number 10, when he was giving medals to my sailors for rescuing Russian sailors in the Far East who were stuck very, very deep, thousands of feet down, where he couldn't rescue them. And he was giving medals out at the time and, uh, and of course, was, was concerned because, because he didn't trust us at that just before that. He hadn't allowed us to go and rescue his sailors from the Kursk, who all died because he wouldn't let us rescue them. So there's been a linkage with the Navy, but I, I find this quite extraordinary. And as you say, I mean, very easy at the beginning to kind of see this as, as, as slightly comedic because it feels like such an absurd claim. But very struck by what you've just said. I mean, are you concerned that this, this could be some sort of pitch ruling propaganda for them to really focus now on, on Britain and try and sort of, you know, take some revenge? Well, I think in all sorts of areas, they're throwing out ludicrous claims and making ludicrous statements because it gives openings then for conspiracy theorists and also to make excuses for um, abhorrent behavior. And, and so I believe there is a, a slight concern, as I said, is this the, you know, a few opening shots of nonsense because it means as things, because things are going to get worse for Russia, there's no doubt about it, uh, because of the Ukrainian nonsense, that um, they do think about You know, doing something to underwater, undersea cables. And then their line, of course, would be, well, 
you know, they did this to us, we do, do it to them, you know, rather like schoolboys. Um, but, but so I do find that of slight concern. But I mean, it is clearly such a nonsense, the claim, and such a nonsense. As, and as you rightly say, I mean, it wasn't for the seriousness of the situation. One would just have to laugh at them. Mm. I think one would just stand and laugh at them. But, but you know, there is that serious thread there. And it's interesting because one of the, the, the lines from the Ministry of Defence um, rebuttal on this, and I think there's a lot in this, it says this invented story says more about the arguments going on inside the Russian government than it does about the West. Um, I mean, what, what do your sources tell you about what is the mindset of the, the Russian military right now and the people around President Putin? Because... You know, however you look at it, it's been pretty disastrous for Russia so far. Well, I mean, I, I have to say, I don't, I don't have a specific line giving me detailed information on this. So it's just what I've drawn from various, uh, you know, from reading various things and and my knowledge of uh, knowledge of military affairs and things. But it's quite clear that um, Putin had managed to get some of his top people to agree to his, what he called a special operation, and how much he had been fed nonsense about the ease of doing that, and how much was him blindly doing it anyway, is very difficult to know. But quite quickly, it became clear what an appalling and dreadful mistake this was. And as things have got worse and worse with his military, so I think a number of the military, particularly middle-ranking military, um, will have become aware that this is all a bit of a disaster, and how how shoddy some of the military structures are within Russia. Um, and therefore, that will, have, that, that will be permeating in various areas. Now, at the top, at the very top, you know, I'm afraid with, with autocrats of this type, it's very difficult to ever replace them and very difficult to get the change. But the, I've, there will be a huge level of concern, I believe, within all the middle structures of the military. And um, a final question to um, Lord West. I mean, we also learned recently that um, Russia was talking about doing some nuclear uh, tests. We know that they have also been doing a false flag about um, dirty bombs with, with Ukraine, possibly to pitch roll them using those type of, of equipment. Do you get the impression that Putin is becoming more and more desperate? And do you think he could do something which crosses that line in terms of using those kind of weapons? Well, there's no doubt this loose talk of nuclear is extremely dangerous. But I mean, he has a track record on nuclear. Going back a few years ago, he introduced what he called his uh, pos uh, his strategy of de-escalation. And his strategy of de-escalation was that if Russia was losing a conventional war, and in those days when he was talking about it, it was on the basis probably of a war against NATO, which it would start to lose, that to de-escalate, they would fire a nuclear weapon into, into somewhere in Europe or something. And that was his strategy of de-escalation. It, it didn't take into account what NATO's strategy was in response, I have to say. Highly dangerous. So this isn't new, this thought of maybe using a a, a, a low-yield nuclear weapon, but it is, it, it is extremely dangerous. And there's no doubt, as a, he's a narcissist as well, he has been talking to himself in a way, and they do this, you know, highly dangerous autocratic narcissists, they talk and talk about it because they're almost trying to justify it in their own mind. Mm. Can I do... And, 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 and all any talk of this is, is so, so dangerous. And one of the few areas within his military that um, he actually has spent a huge amount of money on, and I think it's probably a fairly good nick, is that is that strategic part of, the, uh, of his capability. He spent a lot of money on, not just on current nuclear weapons, um, but actually he's uh, come up with a couple of really horrible um, sort of doomsday type weapons. And you think, what on earth is he doing? Why on earth is he doing this? He's done this over the last five or six years or so. And I do find that extremely worrying. What this war in Europe has shown us. It's bloody vicious and at the end of the day it comes down to the infantry on the ground. So we're going to have to invest more in our land forces who have been woefully underinvested in in the last 10 to 15 yeah. years to make sure that we can play our role in NATO 
in future deployments deterring future Russian aggression. Throughout the programme, we've been assessing the biggest challenges awaiting Rishi Sunak, from the NHS to strike action and the small issue of maintaining harmony within his party. There's lots to be across, but we can't overlook the ongoing war in Ukraine and the careful negotiation of Western allies to support the front line. Lord Dannett is a crossbench peer and former head of the British Army. Good morning to you. Hello, good morning. What's your view on the role that the UK needs to play in the conflict over the coming weeks and months? What does Rishi Sunak need to be mindful of? Well, I think uh, Rishi Sunak has to continue the movement that Boris Johnson uh, started, which was to give steadfast support to Ukraine, indeed amongst the European members of NATO or the European community members themselves. Uh, the UK has been out, uh, out front uh, in giving support to Ukraine, and we have been able to support that to the greatest extent that we can by providing them weapons, ammunition and training, particularly training. Uh, we've trained so far upwards of 6,000 Ukrainian infantrymen uh, in this country, um, giving them a, a, an intense course in how to, to fight their enemy and then sending them back to the front line. So that's really, really important that um, we continue to do that. And also to make sure by bilateral conversations that we maintain the unity uh, of NATO. We maintain the unity of the West and particularly keep the United States as engaged as possible. It's the inter intervention and support from Uncle Sam that has made the biggest contribution to the Ukrainian capability. So Rishi Sunak must be prepared to spend time to take the lead to make sure that Europe and the West stay united and the Americans are on board. Yeah, um, Sunak made a series of calls to world leaders after he was made prime minister. And one of the longest, the Sunday Times reports, was to Zelensky. And um, they discussed um, at length uh, the war. And there was a suggestion there that perhaps President Zelensky had been, um, had been cautious, had needed convincing about Rishi Sunak's dedication to the cause. Apparently, Boris Johnson had told Zelensky that Sunak tried to cut military aid to Ukraine when he was chancellor. So maybe some trepidation. Um, from the president of U U Ukraine there. Um, does, does Rishi Sunak need to demonstrate his faith in the cause? Do you think he'll have to commit to some spending um, in order to try and convince Zelensky um, that he's serious about this and that he's in it for the long term? Well, it's really important that he does uh, persuade Zelensky and the Ukrainian people that he and the United Kingdom does remain four square behind them. Um, that would be most unfortunate if that was not the case. But you also mentioned the question of, of spending. Well, when he was Chancellor, he was obviously looking very carefully at the nation's finances. And we've seen the absolute upheaval and confusion that's been caused during the 44 uh, days of the uh, Liz Truss Premiership. And I think there is a wider point here, and that is that the integrated review of our foreign security and defence policy that was published in March last year. It's now intended to refresh that document. And I think that's really important that it's done. But what is really important, it's not just given to the same officials and ministers who produced it the last time, published it in March last year, but there's external scrutiny of that. Um, I think we need to get uh, think tanks and academia involved in this to make sure that the United Kingdom's defense and security and foreign policy is fit for this part of the 21st century. And, and by that, what I'm really meaning is I'm questioning the tilt towards the Indo-Pacific that was in that uh, review that came out last year. With a war, a bloody war in Europe at the present moment, then I think our focus quite rightly should be on our Euro-Atlantic relations, particularly on Europe itself. And I think that, well, I don't know, I think, I know that translates into uh, an increase, maybe just about now a modest increase in our defence expenditure. And of course, we need to go on investing in high-end technologies, cyber, digital, um, information gathering, precision targeting, all those things. But I'm afraid what this war in Europe has shown us, it's bloody vicious. And at the end of the day, it comes down to the infantry on the ground. So we're going to have to invest more in our land forces who have been woefully underinvested in in the last 10 to 15 yeah. years to make sure that we can play our role in NATO in future deployments, deterring future Russian aggression. Yeah, he's also got a defence secretary, Ben Wallace, who's hinted he may resign if defence spending doesn't uh, doesn't go up to 3% of GDP. So there's a slight pressure there as well. Uh, the threat of nuclear action, that has been taken seriously, isn't it, by the West? Uh, what conversations will Rishi Sunak uh, be having about that? And how does he get involved on the world stage with that discussion? Well, of course, we have to take the nuclear threat seriously. Uh, and the West's response to the threat by Putin and his acolytes 
is that we remain ambiguous about what we would do. And ambiguity is an important part of deterrence. If the other side knows what you would do in a particular series of events, then they can calculate what their response would be. So being ambiguous is not just fudging the issue. Actually, it is an important part of deterrence. And I think we have to keep very much in mind that Putin uh, might use a tactical nuclear weapon on the battlefield. That is part and parcel of former Soviet military doctrine, now Russian military doctrine. But if you just stop and think about it for a while, what are the circumstances that he might do that? Um, let's suggest that there is another Ukrainian breakthrough in the Kherson area, as there was in the Kharkiv area uh, earlier in the autumn, and that there is a, an onrush of Ukrainian troops. That might be the moment that he might choose to use a tacti tactical nuclear weapon, but he would be doing so on land that they have now uh, annexed and have called Russian. So he would be irradiating a three, four, five square kilometer area of what he calls Russian soil, yeah. which would make it uninhabitable for years to come. Does he really want to do that? Yeah. So one has to just bear the practicalities in alongside the rhetoric. And finally, at the Mail on Sunday, Lord Dannett reports today that Liz Truss's personal phone was hacked um, by agents suspected of working for the Russian president, Vladimir Putin. Is there a discussion needed um, about security within government use of message services like WhatsApp? We don't know the information that was taken, but is there a discussion that needs to be had? Are you concerned that security breaches are perhaps easier than they should be at the moment? Security and tight security, which is really important to government, is a matter of discipline. And frankly, our leaders must be sufficiently disciplined to only communicate through authorised means, which themselves uh, are encrypted uh, and are secure. Um, we've seen it with Suella Braverman apparently uh, sending messages that she shouldn't have done on a personal email. And now we get it with Riz Trust. This, frankly, is not good enough. If these people aspire to be in senior positions, positions of leadership, They've got to be disciplined. They've got to follow the rules or, frankly, will put other people in their place. Liz Truss was in a position of leadership. She didn't aspire to be, of course. She was our prime minister, albeit for a short amount of time. Um, are you saying people like our prime minister should not be using message services like WhatsApp? Uh, we know about the personal email issues, but I'm sure that there are lots of messages flying on different messages services, which, which might cause concern to uh, someone who's been in your position. Well, you can use your personal email to ring the housekeeper and say, could you put the cat out? I'm going to be home late. That's absolutely fine. But if you want to communicate government business, use an encrypted handheld device, use, use a secure telephone line, use a secure means of communication. People in senior positions have got access to these security, secure means of, of communicating and they should use them. Not doing so is ill-disciplined and is frank, re reflects very poorly on their judgment. And I come back to using that word discipline. It reflects poorly on their personal self-discipline. Thank you so much for speaking to us. Uh, valid insight there. Lord Dannett, crossbench peer and former head of the British Army. Thank you. Russia says it has completed its call-up of 300,000 military reservists. Defence Minister Sergei Shoigu says over 80,000 reserve troops have already been deployed to Ukraine, with the rest still in training. President Vladimir Putin issued the mobilization order last month to beef up Russian forces in Ukraine. The call-up led to protests. It also prompted hundreds of thousands of Russian men to flee the country. For more, let's get across to Frank Ledwidge. He is a senior lecturer in strategy and law at the University of Portsmouth and a former military intelligence officer. Good to see you again. Um, can you tell us how effective these reservists who have arrived on the ground in Ukraine could be for the Russian military? Well, good morning, Claire. Only about half of these 40,000, according to Putin, are actually going into combat. The other 40,000 are likely to stay behind as logistic support troops. Putin himself said that they were getting between two and three weeks training. That is insufficient, essentially, even to train you to use your rifle properly and work in a very small group. The effectiveness of the combat elements of this, which is about 40,000, as I say, and they'll be spread all over the front, will entirely depend on their commanders at the front. And they've been very variable. So the answer to your question is really they won't make a they won't make a significant difference on the ground at all. At best, they may allow the the uh, uh, Russians to hold some ground, but but nothing more than that. 
Indeed, with cold winter months approaching, Russia has been attacking Ukrainian infrastructure, such as the electricity network, um, demoralizing the Ukrainian population. Uh, but you have actually argued that things could be worse for Russia's forces. Why exactly is that? First of all, Ukraine is getting a great deal of equipment from the West. It's getting hundreds, hundreds of thousands of pieces of, of cold weather gear, enabling the, the Ukrainians, of course, to, to work far better. And that's crucial. In winters, as you well know, in Central Europe can go down, especially in the central Ukraine area, to minus 20, minus 30 degrees centigrade. And you simply can't operate in that. You need some training. You need some uh, good, good equipment. And clearly the Ukrainians are rather better accoutred than that, than a few tens of thousands of conscripts with a couple of weeks training and no unit cohesion. The likelihood is though, that the winter is going to slow things down for everyone, including the Ukrainians who rely really on their success on what's called maneuver warfare. And in weather that slows everyone down, maneuver warfare is probably not going, we're not going to see as much of it as we've seen before. But certainly the Ukrainians are, are far better prepared than the Russians for this. And by the way, when we see the, the kind of equipment and scales that the Russian soldiers and new ones have, uh, I certainly wouldn't want to be in their ranks now. So you expect a slowing down in the months to come. Uh, now, this week, Russia made the claim that Ukraine is manufacturing dirty bombs and that it plans to use them. How would you assess that claim? First of all, it, this is uh, another false flag, another false flag attempt by, by Russia. We had, we had a similar thing with the Novokakovo Dam about two or three weeks ago, where the Russians said they were, the Ukrainians were thinking of destroying it and then said they really weren't. Um, mainly because, of course, it was the Russians who were considering that. As to a dirty bomb, there's no gain for either side on that. It, it, the fear was, of course, that this was another veiled threat by Putin to justify the deployment of some form of low-yield nuclear weapon in response. I doubt that any of this will happen. I think it's more saber-rattling. Until, though, and unless... Ukraine gets into a position where it threatens Crimea. I think that's where some red lines will be crossed. But as to the dirty bomb, look, the only time one, one none has ever been deployed. Uh, there were some allegations in the 90s, Chechens were trying to deploy one. Uh, they're a Cold War trope. Mm. All right, we're going to leave it there. Thank you so much for taking the time, Frank Ledwidge, as always a pleasure. Thank you, Claire. IAEA inspectors are being dispatched to investigate Russia's claim that Ukraine is planning to use a so-called dirty bomb, ratcheting up nuclear anxieties in the conflict. Russian President Vladimir Putin says he directly ordered his defense minister, Sergei Shoigu, to call top NATO commanders to warn them Ukraine plans to detonate a low-yield radioactive device. Kiev has rejected and condemned the claim. Ukraine says Putin is using nuclear blackmail to block support for its counteroffensive against the Russian forces. And there are fears that Putin may be preparing a false flag attack of his own. For more on this, I'm joined by Elena Sokova, executive director of the Vienna Center for Disarmament and Non-Proliferation. Elena Sokova, I'm curious, weren't inspectors already supposed to be on the ground by now? Well, um, last week, uh, actually this week, earlier this week, the International Atomic Energy Agency and its general director, Grossi, announced that the inspectors will be sent to the two facilities that Russia claimed that are developing the dirty bomb, so-called dirty bomb. But it takes time to, for the inspectors to reach uh, the facilities. We are still in the war uh, situation. Mm. They need to go by train or by car, depending on the locations where they go. We also need to be uh, concerned about their safety and security so that their uh, tra transit to, to this facility is secured with uh, some military convoy or other arrangements. So my understanding is they are on their way and should be arriving any day now. So logistics are challenging at these times is how we'll take that. Um, speculation that a dirty bomb could be used has been going on for days now. How valid is that concern? Well, uh, in my 
personal view, um, this is not a particularly valid statement. And um, I would have to really come up with any reasonable explanation. Why would Ukraine do that? Mm. Uh, particularly if the plans are to use it on its own territory. Uh, but it is also something that uh, I think, in my view, probably just a, another destruction. And as was noted, um, an attempt to um, stall some of the support for Ukraine. The uh, dirty bomb, which is a, a literally a radioactive material bound with conventional explosives, uh, is intended to disseminate radiation, but its radius is going to be uh, limited to the level of explosion and maybe a little bit over it if the material is um, easily, uh, can be easily dispersed. But from military standpoint, it makes no sense. What it would lead uh, in terms of casualty, just the people who are um, killed or affected by an explosion itself, uh, which is like a regular explosive, and the contamination of the area. So that is uh, one of the issues with uh, this whole scenario. But the second point is the two facilities that Russia named as a possible facilities involved in it um, don't even have the relevant materials. They may right. have some isotopes uh, mm -hmm. that could be used for the dirty bomb, but claiming that they're going to use some nuclear materials from these facilities makes literally no sense. And uh, we'll have to end it there. That's uh, Elena Sokova. Many, many thanks. You're welcome. Thanks. Now, following the daring drone attack on its Black Sea fleet, Russia has now suspended its participation in the United Nations brokered grain deal. And this has reversed months of diplomatic efforts that were aimed at ensuring food security in the world's poorest regions. Now, Ukraine is one of the world's biggest exporters of food grains. In 2020, Ukraine alone accounted for nearly about 9% of the wheat exports, 15% of the global maize exports and 44% of all sunflower oil in the international market. Many countries of the world, including those of Global North and South, were heavily reliant on Ukraine for the food grain imports. However, when Russia invaded the Ukrainian territories in February, these crucial exports were affected. The Russia captured and also blocked crucial ports on the nation's World Food Programme said that nearly about 47 million people were at the risk of acute hunger due to the global food crisis. The Ukraine grain deal, officially known as the Black Sea Grain Initiative, was brokered by Turkey and the United Nations in the month of July. It eased Russia's naval blockade and also led to the reopening of the three key Ukrainian ports. And since then, nearly about 400 ships, carrying a total of 9 million metric tons, have departed Ukraine's ports. The initiative also helped stabilize and subsequently lower the global food prices, essentially moving precious grain from one of the world's bread baskets to the tables of those in need. At least about 40 countries received Ukrainian foodstuff from this initiative. Nearly 25% of the food that was exported, that was equivalent to 1.8 million metric tons of the food grain, went to the low and the lower middle income countries with vulnerable populations. Some 25% of the food grain went to the upper middle income nations and the rest went to the high income nations. Also, two-thirds of the wheat that was exported under this initiative reportedly was exported to countries in Latin America, Asia, Africa and Oceania. The deal, initially brokered for 120 days, was due to be renewed in November, on, the, on the 19th of November. But with Russia now suspending this deal, grain prices are expected to rise pretty dramatically. Now, experts say that the suspension of this grain deal has once again raised fears of a global food crisis. And reacting to the development, the United States has said that Moscow is weaponizing food. The American President Joe Biden has said that Russia's move is simply outrageous. The United Nations, for its part, has also urged all parties to ensure the continuation of the grain deal, calling it a critical humanitarian effort. Meanwhile, President Volodymyr Zelensky has asked, has asked for a strong international response to Russia's move, particularly from the leaders of G20, which is gathering in a couple of weeks in Indonesia.
All right, now to give us more insights in terms of what is likely to happen next in the battlefields of Ukraine, we're being joined in by Mr. Oleksiy Melnik, who is the co-director of Foreign Relations and also International Security Program at the Razumkov Center in Kiev. Now, Mr. Melnik, thank you very much indeed for taking time out and speaking to us here on Vyond. Now, what we've witnessed in the course of the last 36 hours is a serious escalation in the Russia-Ukraine war where Sevastopol has in fact come under attack. This, of course, is the headquarters of the Russian Black Sea Fleet. And because of this, the Russians say that they are now suspending the United Nations brokered grain deal. How, how do you think, let me first ask you this question, how do you think this is now likely to affect the export of grains out of Ukraine? Uh, good evening. This is a very good question that for combination of questions that we are discussing uh, Russian uh, military uh, failures on the battlefield, and at the same time, Russians' actions to compensate somehow uh, its uh, uh, lack of any progress uh, in, on the battlefield in Ukraine. And I think that the uh, United Nations is absolutely right by saying that Russia is trying to weaponize uh, a grain uh, issue or trying to uh, create as many problems and as possible, not just for Ukraine, for the entire world. And of course, on the eve of the next G20 summit, that's probably one of the uh, issues that Russia can bring into the agenda and force the other leaders to finally meet Putin and try to discuss something with President Putin, who's been isolated heavily for the next, uh, for the last probably more than six months. All right. Now, and also Russia has made some serious allegations. It has said that on the basis of the wreckage of these unmanned surface vessels that were used to target the Russian ships at Sevastopol, it has said that these unmanned surface vessels were using navigation modules that were manufactured or designed at least in Canada. Along with this, Russia has also said that the British Navy is directly involved in both the planning and also in the execution of the sabotage of the Nord Stream 1, Nord Stream 2 pipeline. This is what Russia has accused in the last 36 hours. You know, this war had so far been Russia against Ukraine, but now do you think that instead of just it being a proxy war of Russia against NATO, this is a war that could now escalate from this moment onwards? That's what Russia is trying to, first of all, to present to its own public, that uh, the uh, lack of success in Ukraine is not because of uh, the strengths of the Ukrainian army, or the skills of the Ukrainian uh, force commander, but uh, this is just because Russia is fighting against the, the whole West, against NATO, and uh, I don't see uh, any anything surprising that uh, current uh, sophisticated weapons have, have components made in different countries. Even if you look at the Russian equipment, they have components made in the West. So that, that's just an attempt to explain why Russian forces are performing so, so badly. But again, talking about the, the possible escalations, Russia probably running out of, it, of its resources, and that's why Russia is trying to use energy, to use rain, and all these kind of things to, to escalate in order to force Ukraine, to force international partners, to force, force other vulnerable countries like uh, in the Middle East, in Africa, to support Russian position and to influence Ukrainian political elites to some heavy and uncomfortable compromises in the possible negotiations with Russia. All right, very interesting. Now, lastly, before we let you go, Mr. Melnik, now some people are saying that this attack that was staged on Sevastopol is more a decoy for a counteroffensive that Ukraine wants to carry out to try and capture Kherson. Is that how you see this? Yeah, de definitely. There are very good perspectives for Ukrainian forces to liberate Kherson in a matter of a few weeks. And uh, also many Russian male bloggers admit that uh, Russia actually has no means to defend uh, these temporary occupied areas. And uh, one, of, one of the objectives that Russian 
uh, elite uh, Russian leadership is trying to push is to distract uh, internal public attention from for, from the next failures. And the, the last attack on the Black Sea Fleet has been not just harmful, but uh, very humiliating for the Russian armed forces. Because as we all know, that Russia reported, Russian military command reported months ago that Russia destroyed the whole Ukrainian military capability. And in fact, Ukraine has very, very limited Navy, Navy and maritime force. And even without uh, you know, maritime force, you say Ukraine is still able to fight again against the so-called the second best army in the world. All right. We'll have to leave there. Thank you very much indeed, Mr. Alexei Melnik, for joining us and getting Thank us all those me. insights there. Vyon is now available in your country. Download the app now and get all the news on the move. The war in Ukraine entered a new phase in which drone warfare plays center stage. Can Ukraine successfully repel the wave of Iranian drones launched by Russian forces? What does the Sevastopol drone attack tell us about Ukrainian capabilities in this regard? Our guest today is Dr. Mateusz Piątkowski, specialist in the field of international law and aerial warfare from the University of Łódź in Poland. Hello and welcome to TVP World. Good evening. Thanks for having me again. So let us begin with the Iranian drone situation. How serious is it and what capabilities does Ukraine have to solve this problem? Well, basically, Russia is turning to the drones, uh, I would say, as another, uh, I think, is another example of the, uh, I would call it a real desperation. We have to remember that the Russian Air Forces failed to achieve their superiority over Ukraine. And uh, the window for that was really, really uh, thin, in my opinion, actually. Uh, maybe the opening day of invasion was the window to establish the air support priority over Ukraine. Uh, for instance, what is highly, um, uh, highly uh, important and uh, is telling us a lot about the Rus how the Russia is conducting war in the air. Uh, for instance, we didn't see a single Russian uh, aircraft over, for instance, Western Ukraine. Why? Because there are multiple reasons uh, Russians uh, are trying to avoid the risk. Uh, uh, however, without the risk, you are no getting no operational successes. Uh, and of course, the, the bravery of the Ukrainian air, uh, air defense, uh, Ukrainian uh, interceptors, fighters, uh, and um, uh, the Western deliveries uh, denied in some areas uh, the, the possibility of the Russian um, aircrafts to fly uh, uh, with uh, with safety to, to, to its own. So, so basically, that's, I would say, another another sign of desperation, although I, I think it's a dangerous one because those drones are used in swarms. They are trying to overwhelm the Ukrainian air defense because, because we got to remember, uh, Ukraine need to fire a missile, which of course could cost a uh, couple of thousand of uh, of dollars, why the uh, uh, Iranian drones are, especially uh, those one deployed against the Kiev, around 20,000, they're costing around 20,000 US dollars. So basically, we, we need to fire the same missile against, for instance, an SU-30, which is uh, approximately 30 million, 25, 30 million a state-of-the-art aircraft, and we got to fire the same missile against the target, which is only $20,000. So, of course, there is a classical economy economical disproportion in this regard. Uh, but uh, Russians are trying to use drones as, um, uh, as swarms in order, and the swarm tactics uh, is uh, aiming to overwhelm uh, the uh, Ukrainian defenders, to overwhelm the um, directions of the attack, to mislead the Ukrainians about the possible direction of the attack, and to deplete the capabilities of the Ukrainian uh, air defense. Uh, U.S. President Joe Biden said the U.S. will be trying to disrupt these drone deliveries using various means. Is it possible to resort to international law in order to do that? Is Iran breaching its obligations by delivering these drones to Russia? Well, it is uh, believed that, uh, of course, we have to turn to the neutrality laws. And uh, while in terms of Ukrainian-Russian uh, conflict we are seeing a major shift, 
basically the classical rule of neutrality that um, means simply you cannot deliver weapons to the belligerent. However, what we are seeing now, we are seeing an exception forming. I believe that's a quite important exception that actually it is permissible to support military the victim of the aggression. However, when we are speaking about the aggressor themselves, I think the neutrality laws are still standing. So basically, uh, you cannot uh, support a belligerent who is aggressor. Uh, in this regard, uh, we have to remember that Iran is already heavily sanctioned country, especially by the United States, uh, despite the, those sanctions, which are, I have to say, very, very severe regime. Uh, Iran has still capabilities to procure, uh, produce uh, uh, some sophisticated aerial systems. I do believe one way, of course, is a diplomacy. Uh, another way is, of course, um, uh, looking towards the possible uh, uh, shipment routes, how those drones are delivered uh, in this regard. Uh, and um, who knows? Um, however, I'm not very sure whether the United States will eventually intervene military against Iran. I think at this moment, uh, this intervention may not be always backed very much by the international law. However, still, the international community could uh, uh, could definitely condemn uh, supporting the aggressor with uh, uh, with uh, weapons that help uh, uh, the aggressor conduct and prolong the armed conflict. And especially since it could be argued that the Iranian weapons are used to uh, perform um, actions directed strictly against civilians, which is, of course, a war crime. Now, moving on to the situation in Sevastopol, what does the attack tell us about Ukrainian capabilities? Have they made any progress which now will allow them to perform more deep strikes into Russian-controlled territories? Well, I think uh, Ukrainian military surprised us uh, and is still surprising us uh, during this whole conflict with its capabilities and uh, uh, generally uh, a very, very, I would say, uh, a sophisticated approach to the to the modern warfare using different platforms. And we believe that the first information coming from Sevastopol are indicating that the naval drones uh, are being used against the uh, Russian uh, Russian naval base in Sevastopol. That actually the drones, the naval drones, so UNAMIT uh, vessels breach the perimeter of the base and actually uh, uh, there is possibility that they inflict uh, some damage on the Russian warships stationing there. Basically, I think the Ukraine has uh, already a lot of capabilities to strike targets in the Crimea, of course. Uh, in this regard, uh, the drones, uh, uh, the, the naval drones are actually something quite new. But in terms of gaining the air superiority, I think there is still a lot of things that need to be delivered to Ukraine in order to, to establish such a uh, superiority over uh, over Crimea. I'm not saying even about the whole Russian territory, about the uh, southern section of the front. Uh, Ukraine needs more sophisticated uh, um, attack aircrafts. They need to have uh, electronic warfare aircrafts as well, because basically in order to breach the, the um, Russian air defense, we need to use a lot of different platforms. And of course, the drones are one way of, uh, of, uh, of uh, dealing with the multi-layer uh, air defense in this regard. So I think this is, another, uh, this is another show of Ukrainian capabilities, Ukrainian tactical instinct, uh, uh, um, uh, tactical uh, uh, operation uh, uh, thinking. And I think this indicates that basically Ukraine has a for 100 percent, lot of capabilities, I think, to strike military targets. Uh, I think in the in the south section Ukraine, and I think also in in, in a, a close proximity to the to the border with the Russia as well. And one quick question: uh, Russia, in retaliation for this attack, stated that it is suspending the grain deal. What remedies are available uh, at, right now when it comes to international law? Well, when we are talking about the grain deal, I think um, a grain deal was based on the goodwill of the both 
belligerents in this regard, namely, of course, the, the goodwill of Russia, which, of course, the Russia was uh, impacted and influenced by the UN in this regard. I think uh, the next step, if uh, if those rumors are true, if the Russia is indeed going to suspend, I think the Ukraine need to turn to the UN Secretary General, who actually broke this deal months ago. And I think uh, this is um, this is the person which uh, Ukraine uh, should start talking with in regard to a um, possible, uh, possible reaction to this. Uh, and of course, there have been also a lot of discussion. However, this is a serious step, whether, for instance, NATO warships could escort vessels with grain, uh, although, although we gotta understand that this might be considered quite grave step. And also we have to remember there is also a question whether Turkey allows uh, NATO warships to cross uh, uh, across the Bosphor Straits in order to escort those ships uh, to safety. Uh, there are a few options, but I think the first option is to, uh, is to uh, refer this case to the UN. And the question of Turkey is very interesting because, after all, it is a NATO member, so in theory it should facilitate such a move, but the current situation is quite complicated indeed. Dr. Mateusz Piątkowski was our guest today here on TVP World. Thank you very much for joining us. Thank you very much. And you are watching TVP World. Please stay with us for more latest news and updates. Resolution where we have, through a military, a diplomatic, a security effects, made it abundantly clear to Putin that he cannot prevail in Ukraine militarily, might force him. Um, at least into um, uh, 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 finally abandoning his um, ambitions to um, stop, you know, stop Ukraine being a country, which is what it wants. That That is phase one, and, and we, we are not there yet. We spent a lot of time discussing the many challenges facing us at home, but what of the ever-growing tensions abroad? Russia's war in Ukraine continues, and the Chinese regime continues to cause concerns over both politics in Taiwan and the security of our politics here in the UK. So how should these uh, policies, politicians and officials be reading the constantly changing foreign policy and security landscape? Joining us now is Sir Alex Younger, who until two years ago was the chief of the secret intelligence service, uh, better known perhaps as MI6. Thank you very much indeed for joining us. Uh, just want to start by asking you about all the various stories about Liz Truss's phone being hacked by the Russians, about Suella Bravman uh, not following protocols uh, concerning secrecy as a cabinet minister. What is your understanding of what should be expected of uh, ministers and indeed prime ministers in terms of uh, their official uh, work and their uh, contacts in, in, in the electronic media? Well, I think there's a broader issue here, and I encourage us not to be throwing too many stones at the moment about the general levels of cybersecurity uh, that exist around the, all of the critical functions in our country. Um, levels of education aren't high enough, um, and I don't think people are, are focusing enough on, on the risks to uh, their security and their devices, because these are hidden threats that aren't properly understood. I think that's as true of ministers as anyone else, and there's a premium on making sure that they're properly educated. And then there are a set of rules, of course. I don't know uh, the detail of these cases and I can't really say one way or the other what the transition or any transgression might have consisted of. I would be extremely surprised, by the way, though, if the sort of material that we handle in the agencies, so secret intelligence material, gets anywhere near uh, mobile devices connected to the internet in, in ministerial hands or otherwise. I heard one expert say this morning that basically they should only be using so-called secure phones and secure uh, computers, uh, both for their personal and their official business. Would you agree with that? I, there's no such thing. So if something's connected to the internet, it's inherently vulnerable one way or the other. It's about um, management of risk. And so I would steer away from statements quite as blanket as that. But I certainly think that people should understand the risks. And by the way, I think... Um, uh, we should avoid the seductive idea of a completely um, um, secure device. Uh, there's, there's no such thing if it is connected to the internet. That goes back to the education point I was making earlier. 
Sir Alex, given what you've just said and about managing risk, do you think that ministers should be taking their phones into meetings with nations, representatives from nations that we're not necessarily overly friendly with? Again, I mean, I, I think it's important to be providing people with simple and clear advice. Um, what I would want is for them to understand the vulnerabilities of doing that. Just to be, be clear, how would you assess the level of threat? I mean, are you basically saying that the Russians, the Chinese, the Iranians are just out there constantly trying to hack into these channels of communication? Yeah, I think um, what we call the attack surface is going up all the time. A lot of our life is lived in the digital domain, which is intrinsically vulnerable. And the, um, the, the techniques and tools available to offensive cyber operators are becoming more sophisticated. And the issue here, by the way, is also a sort of proliferation one. It's not just the state threat, the sort of thing I would have been dealing with. Um, if you look at Pegasus, the notorious um, malware created by the NSO group, an Israeli company, uh, that that for a while could be got onto your phone through um, a vulnerability in the um, iMessage that um, in a way that didn't even require you to do anything stupid. It, it's what we call a zero click attack. So a lot of this is about risk management, about understanding what can be done, um, about understanding the need to just do the basics right and make yourself as low a target as possible. Um, and and uh, as I say, us all being reasonably humble about, about the need to educate ourselves better on all of these issues. Now, the British and American security services in the run-up to the conflict in Ukraine took the unusual decision of making a lot of material intelligence available uh, so that the world could see what was going on. Uh, now that there is a terrible war going on in, in Yugoslavia, is that still the policy? No, I'm incredibly proud of the way my former colleagues used intelligence. There's a there's a fact that often the the sources and methods used to get that intelligence are very delicate. Um, we should not be in any way cavalier about the um, way in which we use such material. But equally, um, it's collected for a reason, often um, uh, employing people putting themselves at personal risk to do so. And it's incumbent on us to make sure it has an effect. And uh, it really had an effect in this case. They obviously thought extremely carefully about the risk reward balance of, of doing this. Um, but what it did is it completely shot Putin's fox. It made any, any claim on his part that he'd been provoked into this war risible. And I think it did a huge amount to um, pull together that alliance in a way that was cohesive and in a way that was a huge downside surprise for Vladimir Putin. So I think it's good. I've always thought that, you know, we need to remember the purpose of intelligence collection, which is not intelligence collection. It's to, it's to change things that matter. And using it, including publicly, has got to be a part of that tool set. So I welcome this development. Obviously, we're not going to be cavalier about it, but this material is there. It's, 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 it's collected at cost and risk. It's there to be used. I'm interested then in your take on what Russia is currently doing, talking about the pipeline explosion, suggesting that that was something that the UK was responsible for, essentially turning turning that into propaganda material. Do you think that Putin has learned some of those lessons from the early stages of this conflict and is now turning things to his advantage when it comes to using propaganda? Um, well, look, uh, he's obviously got an intelligence background, but the Russians have been doing disinformation um, propaganda since the time of the Tsar. It's a thing that they appear to attach particular importance to. It's absolutely not new. And we don't do disinformation. What we do is operationalizing the truth. That is the big difference. But, you know, they, they have been at this for a while. And of course, in cyber and in the digital domain, they've got a whole new set of opportunities. Um, now, when it comes to the sort of stuff they've been saying recently, uh, uh, the idea that, you know, we were involved in the um, uh, sabotage of the pipeline or that Ukraine's intent on making a dirty bomb, uh, that's all rubbish, clearly. To be absolutely clear, there is no grounds there at all. Um, but uh, in the warped world in which Vladimir Putin lives, I don't know. I mean, he, he probably this is disinformation. Maybe someone's told him it's true. You know, there's no checks and balances on the way. Uh, information is um, uh, is transmitted within an autocracy. You're I would say, sorry, can, can sorry, I just carry on? Yeah, please. Yeah, which is that, um, 
in the context of the dirty bomb, and I think probably also these ludicrous claims around the pipeline, uh, well, there has one been one good um, side effect, which is that um, the Russians got in touch and wanted to talk. Um, and uh, that's positive. A thing that has really worried me about this war is a complete paucity of any real meaningful senior level contacts. And I think I would expect that conversation to allow the Western side to have laid out really clearly its aims for Putin to be defeated in Ukraine and to put the Russians on the spot and extract from them undertakings that they will behave with restraint, say, in the respect of nuclear use. Now, you may choose not to believe those undertakings, but it, it's a start that that conversation even happened. What is your best assessment of the state of the Ukraine conflict right now? Well, I think um, we're going into a score draw at the moment and uh, eight months on. So if you'd said to me on 24th of February that that's where we would be now, you know, I'd have taken it. I would have been delighted. And it's massive testament to the to the will and sheer imagination of, of Ukraine and its resilience and, of course, the quality of Western support. Uh, but it is only a score draw. I think we are getting a bit carried away when we imagine that Ukraine is about to advance and carry it all before it. And certainly Putin goes into the winter with a significant amount of confidence that that Europe writ large will buckle in the face of his energy blackmail. And I think that's misplaced confidence, but he certainly doesn't think that he's losing yet. So you, you feel that it will end up with uh, Ukraine having to give up territory? I think um, uh, it's far too early to say that. So I think Western policy, you know, which has been pretty unsettled, I would, I would completely acknowledge, uh, is fundamentally uh, for this to end in a way that means that it actually has finished rather than just provided Putin with some kind of frozen conflict where he regenerates his forces and tries again. And until there's really clear indication that he's completely given up on any idea that he can win this militarily, there isn't a conversation. After that, there is a conversation, obviously. Um, this is that, this, that is how this ends. Um, but any idea that that's done over the heads of the Ukrainians against their wishes, which is clearly what Putin's angling for, I don't see any appetite for that within the West. But do you think it's realistic to suggest that President Putin will ever give up on his military aims? I mean, that's what you seem to suggest would be a, a, a start of an end point. But from everything that we see from Russia, that doesn't look like it will ever be possible. Yeah, uh, it's, it's a really good question. And I think we need to have low expectations of, of meaningful sort of diplomatically endorsed peace while Putin is in power. So I think it is more likely um, eventually that that he is he is fought to a standstill um, increasingly tries to um, impose a frozen conflict and hold on to what he's got in Ukraine, uh, with the Ukrainians increasingly pressurizing that. But as I said, the forces are quite evenly balanced, and I don't think that happens overnight. But yeah, a sort of change of heart, a change in the character of Vladimir Putin, yeah, you're right, that's very unlikely. So ultimately, if we take that to its logical conclusion, really, resolution could only come if President Putin were non no longer in power. I think um, resolution that that's, that augurs um, Russia's reintegration into the international community, the full lifting of sanctions, etc. That's absolutely true. Resolution where we have, through a military, a diplomatic, a security effect, made it abundantly clear to Putin that he cannot prevail in Ukraine militarily, might force him um, at least into um, uh, 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 finally abandoning his um, ambitions to um, stop, you know, stop Ukraine being a country, which is what it wants. That that is phase one, and, and we, we are not there yet. Finally, you you talked about uh, the case of Russia being allowed back into the international community. Do you think really the story of the next few decades is going to be so-called decoupling with uh, both in the tech area uh, and militarily? basically uh, the West are retreating back into its shell uh, and becoming effectively the competitor with China, Russia? Well, I, I agree with the first half of that statement, and it's important to notice that I'm old enough to remember at the end of the Cold War, we thought democracy was the answer, and the only question was how long it was going to take everyone to catch up. It's now obvious that was massively over-optimistic, and the world is diverging into different blocks and there's a competition between value systems. And that is going to end in a degree of decoupling in key areas, strategic areas like data and, and high technology. 
retreating into our shell, I would really reject that. This is the West's opportunity to remember what it's for, double down on its strengths, renew its alliances, empower its innovation. These, that doesn't sound very much to me like retreating into our shell. On the contrary, I think it's an opportunity here, boosted by the really extraordinary cohesion shown in Ukraine, to actually get our act together. That sounds like it would be quite expensive, though. Would you look to the government to invest in those kind of ambitions? 3% defence target, for example, maybe even more than that. No, I think, um, I mean, maybe, but uh, I um, uh, I think that the things that I want to see happen, most importantly of all, maintaining our capacity to innovate technically faster than our authority and rivals, isn't just not expensive. The alternatives are very expensive, becoming completely dependent on Um, products, goods and services and data provided from other regimes. That sounds very expensive to me. And finally, I have to ask you that there was a story in the last fortnight of RAF fast jet pilots recruited recruited to help train Chinese counterparts. Are you concerned about that? Well, I don't know the truth of that, but clearly if that's true, it shouldn't be happening. Sir Alex Younger, thank you for joining us on Sunday morning. Welcome to our program and uh, today I welcome my guest, uh, it's Natalie Tocci, it's a political scientist and director of the Instituto Fari Internazionali at Vienna, that, am I right? That am is right? in Rome, in Rome, but in Rome. it's perfectly pronounced, okay. I'm very impressed. Okay, I tried before, <laughs> so I tested myself. Anyways, we talk a lot about Ukraine everywhere on television, but today, um, um, including your uh, experience, I would like to know a little bit more about Europe and what's going on in Europe right now. And I'd like to start uh, from uh, the uh, your latest article in Politico that I read. Uh, in this issue, you conclude that uh, while the United States can ensure that Russia loses uh, this war, only the uh, European Union can ensure Ukraine wins it. And uh, for this, it needs to do more. So can you please point the top challenges changes uh, you noticed in Europe's perception of Russia in uh, European Union and around the world of, I'd say, big politics uh, since the 24th of February? Well, well, firstly, it's a real pleasure to be on uh, on this show. I'm very, very happy to, to be here. I mean, I would say that as far as views on Russia are concerned, um, Europeans are actually not divided. I mean, you know, Russia used to be probably one of the most divisive subjects in uh, in European foreign policy, uh, with countries like my own, Italy, that tended to be rather supportive of Russia, countries in Eastern Europe that used to traditionally be very uh, sceptical. So it was always a very divisive subject. Um, I think that beginning on, you know, 24th uh, of February, uh, that has changed. And and I think that has changed for good. Uh, What I mean by this is that you will not find anyone in Europe that actually, at least overtly, explicitly supports Russia. So that's kind of game over. Now, what you do find in Europe, of course, are different views. And these different views relate, I would say, not so much uh, to, you know, hey, don't we, you know, sort of, do, do, do we support Putin? No one really does. I mean, perhaps, you know, very, very small minorities here and there. But, uh, you know, I would say that there are elements of European public opinion and to an extent, perhaps, uh, some governments that are, I would say, particularly tempted by... Point number one, the, how can I put it, the allure of peace, the sirens of peace, Mm -hmm. peace, 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 and of course peace in this particular context uh, tends to then translate into, well, the war must stop now, and for the war to stop now, of course, this also entails that Ukraine must stop uh, in its liberation campaign. So, in a sense, covered, quote unquote, with the language of peace, and you know, who's against peace? No one can be against peace. Uh, You then tend to have, in a sense, some pro-Russian views that tend to come in back through the back door. 
I would say that a second set of uh, sort of concerns, uh, which then again, not explicitly, but in a sense implicitly, uh, risk going into, in a sense, uh, a, a Russian narrative, is obviously everything surrounding the energy crisis, the uh, economic crisis, uh, and and therefore the idea of, which again is, is an illusion, you know, the idea of if only the war were to stop, we could go back to the good old days. Now, the good old days uh, were not that good, and they're certainly gone. Uh, but I would say that, again, amongst some quarters of European public opinion, you would tend to have, you know, this question of, uh, you know, I get it a lot on social media. I mean, every time since the beginning of the war, you know, initially, obviously, speaking out very strongly um, in favor of energy sanctions, uh, now, you know, really sort of holding the line to say, you know, these sanctions have to uh, be there. They have to strength, be strengthened. Them, they certainly uh, cannot be removed. You know, you would get sort of, you know, people uh, on social media coming out at you and saying, hey, you know, are you going to be paying my energy bills, therefore? Mm -hmm. So you would have, in a sense, both through that energy angle and through the peace, uh, if you like, angle, some pro-Russian views that kind of creep back into the debate. Now, having said all this, do I therefore think that these views are going to prevail uh, or that they're going to lead uh, Europe to actually reduce its support for Ukraine? Absolutely not. I mean, I here on screen put my hand, well, I don't put my hand, but I, you know, figuratively put my hand on fire, you know, sort of very confident that um, it will not lead to a reduction of, of support uh, for Ukraine. Now, the argument, uh, coming back to my political piece, the argument that I make in that piece is that it's not good enough not to reduce support. <laughs> the point is that actually we have to increase the support uh, we provide for Ukraine. Now, I make comparisons uh, between uh, Europe and the United States. And, you know, in fairness, this is, you know, in some respects, a little bit unfair mm -hmm. uh, to make this comparison, but I make it nonetheless. I say it's unfair because in many ways, uh, Europe has been shouldering indirectly uh, a lot of the costs of this war. In many respects, more, far more so than the United States. Uh, one only needs to think about the, the cost, uh, uh, the human and the economic cost of hosting uh, millions of Ukrainian refugees. Uh, and this is cost to states, but it's also cost to individual families. Uh, you know, my own family, we've been hosting a, fa you know, a Ukrainian family uh, since March of, uh, of this year. So there, there, there is that and there's a lot of that obviously going on, uh, which it obviously is far more you know, prominent in Europe compared to the United States. And then, of course, there's also the cost that is much higher in Europe of the energy crisis. Mm -hmm. You know, yes, in the United States, you know, sort of uh, uh, Americans complain about the high uh, gas prices at the petrol station. But if you look at the differences, I mean, there's literally no comparison uh, whatsoever. And of course, we know that those rising energy costs are a consequence of Russia's weaponization uh, of energy, which is part and parcel of, of this war. So I kind of put those two caveats there because otherwise it, it kind of looks like, you know, my criticism is a little bit unfair uh, looking at Europe and the United States. But having said all this, I think that it's still worth highlighting the fact that why should we be doing more? And here I come back to the conclusion uh, of that piece. We should be doing more because as I say in that piece, although militarily, uh, it is the United States that will make a difference in terms of Ukraine defeating Russia, because you defeat Russia militarily. Uh, but in terms of Ukraine winning, Ukraine will not win only militarily. Ukraine will win uh, if it uh, consolidates as a uh, liberal democracy, if its, uh, if its economic reconstruction uh, is ongoing, uh, if its security is going to be guaranteed, and all of those things cannot rely on the United States. This is mainly a European affair. 
I see. But uh, talking about uh, the attitude of people, of the societies of different countries of uh, the European Union, we understand that uh, first, uh, each country has uh, its own abilities to help Ukraine. I mean, there is difference in economical situation among the countries of European Union. And the second thing is uh, the informational uh, fields that we have for different countries of European Union. I mean, uh, you're talking about the energetic crisis and the prices that are rising, the people thinking about it, people not afraid to be cold in winter, they're afraid uh, to not be possible to pay for these energetic uh, needs and so on. So do people of Europe, it doesn't matter, Western Europe or Eastern Europe, really uh, understand the depth that you just uh, told me. I mean, not only we have to win Russia uh, because uh, it will save our nation, but because we are really defending European uh, values. So do these people understand, do this enough uh, informational messages in uh, press, in social media, in European countries and who is making this informational field? Well, I think, you know, some countries obviously do very much. I mean, you know, those countries in Eastern Europe uh, that have been also exposed to kind of Russian and, and Soviet colonialism uh, uh, have very clear in their mind what this war is all about. So I would say that countries in Eastern Europe, um, both governments and public opinion uh, is very, you know, are very clear on all of this. Um, of course, you know, we can, you know, look at Hungary and countries like, you know, Bulgaria, obviously being slightly different in this respect, but by and large, I would say that this is understood. Now, you know, countries in, in Western Europe, in Southern Europe, um, I would say that broadly speaking, governments understand it. Mm -hmm. uh, so, you know, whether this is uh, Italy or France or Spain or Germany, I think governments understand it. Uh, you know, governments then obviously have to deal with all of the complexities of, and therefore, what does it mean to understand it? Huh? Uh, because, of course, you obviously need to, um, you know, sort of policy is made of, of, of choices and, and kind of, you know, difficult choices at times. You want to support Ukraine, but you need to ensure that your uh, citizens are able to pay their gas bills, uh, and that requires money. Uh, so it's kind of, you know, how do you allocate the funds that you have available? So I think governments understand the stakes which of course does not make uh, it like solutions, easy solutions, but they understand that they need to find them. I would say that public opinion in uh, countries that are further away from the front lines, so countries in Southern Europe, countries in Western Europe, I would say that they understand that, that this is a war that is about values. I think they do understand it. Uh, I think the question becomes trickier when it then translates into, and therefore, what is the price that you are willing to pay uh, in order to defend uh, those values? And, you know, I mean, one thing is governments, one thing is, you know, experts, uh, foreign policy people, in a sense, like, like myself. Um, and, and quite another is, you know, the layman uh, or the lay woman on the street uh, that has daily problems that are far removed uh, from Ukraine, or rather, apparently far removed from Ukraine. So I think, and this gets into the story about information, uh, or rather disinformation, um, I think that their you know, narratives are fundamentally important. That lay man or lay woman on the street uh, needs to understand that this is not about values in a kind of abstract sense, uh, because their economic prosperity, their uh, freedoms, their security, and their ability to pay gas bills as well, mm -hmm. this is actually fundamentally connected to not only this war, but this war 
that needs to be won, you know, in, in, in a particular way. So, you know, this is where uh, information comes in, but then also where disinformation comes in, uh, because it's, you know, it's not just about getting the facts out, it's about getting the story out, it's about getting the narrative right. When you say that governments understand, uh, I uh, would like to go to the uh, some past interviews of you, and I found some interesting quotes uh, from the internet. So I will quote the the conversation uh, with you. So Europe will not risk its stability and habitual way of life, warmth and of homes, and the work of industry because of the country that doesn't even exist. It's how Putin showed Ukraine before in an informational war. So Putin has been preparing this informational not only for his population but also for European society that affects decisions in the European Union parliaments and with the money raining on the politicians that allowed him all these manipulations through years. So my question is whether all these politicians uh, were aware of what they are doing or that uh, they uh, just were very blind and simply illiterate that they as well believed in all these words of Kremlin and uh, counted the gifts in euros and dollars from Putin's hands and really situation changed right now. So do you see the politicians that were corrupted by Russian money are opened now and they're not at the power right now? So I would kind of, you know, obviously these things are, are connected, but I would uh, make the distinction between, um, in a sense, the in a sense, it's a sort of a, the distinction between the values and the interests. Huh? I mean, they're obviously interrelated, but but they're slightly different stories. So I think that as far as the, if you like, ideational, the value side of all of this, um, I do think that prior to this war, there was quite a bit of ignorance uh, across Europe. Uh, and by the way, I think actually in the United States too, for reasons that I'll come to it in a moment, about um, how much the Ukrainian nation had actually developed in recent years. Um, you know, there was a widespread assumption in the months leading up to the war, where as we no U.S. intelligence, uh, U.K. intelligence were really making, you know, the case of, hey, you know, a war is about to start. Um, but there was, uh, which of course was, was right, uh, but where I think everyone in the West, including the United States, got it very wrong, was in assuming that Ukraine would not hold up. Now, that assumption, which turned out to be, of course, a wrong assumption, you know, one has to sort of try and understand why was that assumption so wrong? So, on the one hand, of course, one can say, well, because obviously there was an overestimation of Russia's military capacities, which I think is one side of the story. But I think the other side of the story, which gets to this ignorance uh, point that I wanted to highlight, is that there was an underestimation of Ukrainian resilience. And there was an underestimation of Ukrainian resilience because, of course, without buying completely the Russian narrative of the Ukrainian nation doesn't exist, so without going that far, there were still some doubts as to, you know, to what extent, you know, is Ukraine, you know, is Ukraine and Ukrainian identity really strong enough uh, to stand up to Russia? Uh, so, you know, Propaganda doesn't necessarily, you know, and disinformation doesn't necessarily mean that you buy 100% of the rubbish that is being mm -hmm. sold to you. But if you just buy 20%, you know, that's, uh, that's also a problem. So I think there was, I would say, ignorance in, in that respect. And I think that indeed the way in which... Uh, the war has gone, particularly the way in which Ukraine uh, resisted in those very early days of the war, uh, really kind of, they, they really led to a, a very abrupt change in, in European uh, perceptions and, of course, American uh, perceptions too. Then I think there's the, um, in a sense, the, the commercial interests, perhaps the, the corruption, I mean, you know, the, the interests part of, uh, of this story. Now, I would say that, you know, even without getting into corruption, um, there were obviously uh, quite a lot of 
commercial interests going on. Uh, and, you know, so that it is true that uh, Europe was hooked on cheap Russian gas. You know, one that was not corruption. Uh, it was basically a kind of commercial uh, relationship uh, that was thought of as being a win-win for both. And this is something that you know dates back from Ostpolitik, uh, and it dates back from from Cold War uh, days. Yes. Uh, and I think progressively, as time went on, the convenience of that relationship made us as Europeans increasingly blind to the fact that this was not just a commercial relationship. The time would come, and in fact the time came, when that relationship, as we now see, became weaponized. And so in many respects, we are now paying the price of the blindness. So I highlight this because I think this is the main story. Yes, you know, maybe on the margins there's some corruption here, corruption there, but I think the main problem, in a sense, was not seeing that the economic and energy relationship between Europe and Russia was not just economic and, uh, and energy, but it was really very, you know, political, politicized and securitized. Unfortunately, there were at least two times uh, when it was time to pay attention to this alarm. First, uh, when uh, Russia manipulated with gas, it was, uh, if I'm not mistaken, 2007. Yeah, 2000, when... exactly, 2006 yes. and 2009 Ye again. Yes. And we didn't do yes. anything. And next time, when uh, all of of, uh, our parliament uh, uh, members and uh, our neighbor countries from uh, Western Europe uh, were shouting out n not letting Putin build this northern uh, pipe too. Uh, so no one listened to it. And uh, backing uh, to the quotes from the interviews against with you, I see one more quote. Europe made two global mistakes. One, bet on the hope for security from the United States since uh, 1945. And the second one is belief in energy security support by Russia and building this Northern Stream altogether. It's like commercial project. But uh, anyways, uh, all of the countries with normal psychic, they were thinking that it's commercial and it's uh, for the future interest, but not about schizophrenic dreams of some sick dictator. So uh, now you see Europe uh, fixes uh, these two main mistakes? Well, I would say, in fact, I think there are three uh, like dangerous dependencies. I think there's the energy dependence, uh, of course, with, with Russia. There's the defense dependence on the United States. And there's the economic dependence on China. Yes. Uh, and I think all these three things are, you know, sort of similar but very different stories. So I'm, where I'm very optimistic is, is actually uh, on Russia. <laughs> uh, I think that the die is cast on, you know, I think that the energy, Europe's energy dependence on Russia is game over. If you think of it, it's really quite surprising that in seven months, um, we have gone down from 40% of gas dependence on, uh, uh, on Russia to around 9% in seven months. Uh, oil is basically when the embargo kicks in at the end of this year, will go to zero. So, you know, this is really a, a kind of Copernican revolution that has happened in, in seven months. And there isn't a world in which let's say the war ends tomorrow morning, yeah? Even if the war were to end tomorrow morning, Europe is not gonna go back to that energy dependence with Russia. Because now that it is clear that energy, that it was not, as we were saying earlier, just a commercial relationship, mm -hmm. uh, but that it was a, a politicized and securitized relationship, there is no way that European companies, European governments are gonna go back. It's, it's game over. Uh, so on that, I'm actually very optimistic. Excuse me, it's, uh, we're talking about if uh, Putin stays but war stops, or if uh, the political system changes in Russia, 
nothing will go. To be honest, okay. I think it's too late now uh, because it is, you know, we, we are now suffering so much the consequences of, of, of what has happened that there's no trust anymore that Russia is a reliable energy provider. Uh, that is, that credibility has gone, whether it's Putin or whether it's someone else. Uh, I mean, you know, unless Russia tomorrow morning becomes a shining liberal democracy, but that is far less likely even than the war ending tomorrow morning. I mean, mm. that's just not going to happen, right? So I, I think on energy, it's going to be painful uh, because it's happened in a very rapid way, but I think it's irreversible. Where I think the story is more mixed is uh, our economic dependence on China. The United States is going to push us very much uh, in terms of loosening that relationship. I think that we as Europeans, especially since the pandemic, understand uh, that you know, this is not just an economic relationship. But again, it's an economic relationship with a strategic edge. So I think even without uh, US persuading, um, we would be, in a sense, we, we want to be more cautious. And I think the point is how to find a new balance, in a sense, between security and efficiency, between security and, and prosperity. And I think that's a new uh, balance that will need to be found. Where I'm less optimistic is actually on defense. Now, it is true that uh, Europe is waking up on defense. Uh, it is spending more on defense um, as a consequence of, of this war, and, and finally this is happening. But it doesn't mean that our dependence on the United States is actually reducing. It is actually increasing. Uh, and it's increasing because as we buy military equipment, a lot of this equipment is American. And it's American because Europeans are still developing theirs. Mm -hmm. and, and given that you need it now, you buy what is available. And what is available is, is a lot of buy American. Now, you may say, well, what, why is that a problem? And I would reply, well, today it's not a problem. Today we have Joe Biden sitting in the White House. Not a problem. But what if tomorrow uh, you have Trump, uh, you have another Republican president uh, that, like Trump did, questions uh, NATO's Article 5? Where would it leave us, you know, at a time in which we are, of course, you know, you, Ukraine, you're on, in a sense, the front line, but this is a war. I mean, Russia is de facto at war with Europe as a whole um, by sabotaging critical infrastructure, by weaponizing energy, by, you know, cyber, I mean, you know, all of the other aspects uh, of, of this war. So I think the de defense dependence on the United States uh, continues to be, I think, a real reason for concern, and I would add, I think it should be not only a reason for European concern, I actually think it should be a reason for American concern as well. Mm -hmm. uh, talking about China, I've heard uh, an interesting question uh, from the audience, so I will just uh, repeat it. The longer the war, the greater the benefit to China, financial and political. All Russia's energy resources go there instead of the U European Union, and Russia is completely dependent on China. So we're going back to bipolar world, and what role Europe will play in this bipolar world? I think it's a really, really good question. Um, now, you know, I think you can, one can look at it in different ways. So on one level, I think, yes, it's absolutely correct. China, in many ways, has been benefiting uh, from, uh, uh, from this war. Uh, it is uh, getting quite a lot of uh, Russian oil at a very big discount. Now, I don't think that uh, China is going to be getting the Russian gas that Russia no longer sends to Europe because gas, unlike oil, requires the building of infrastructure. Uh, and this, if it happens, it will happen in a long time. I think there's then a long-term question about, you know, on the one hand, one can make the argument that China is going to benefit from Russia basically being a very, very diminished country, uh, economically, strategically, militarily, energetically, I mean, in all possible ways. And, you know, essentially, uh, Russia is going to be 
sort of, you know, China's junior cousin. Now, I think on one level, you can say that. On another, it really depends on, on what happens right, in this war. I mean, what happens to Russia? Because if Russia, in a sense, kind of turns into a massive North Korea, to what extent and, and what are the political implications in Russia itself over time, to what extent is this not a burden actually to China as well? Question mark. So I think it largely depends on how exactly Russia is going to develop uh, as a consequence of what is happening now uh, with, with the war. And then I would say in terms of the question of kind of, you know, is this a new bipolarity? I think yes, in the sense that it is very clear that the world, you know, to put it a la Joe Biden, you know, is kind of divided between democracies and autocracies. Although I also think that this is not going to be like the Cold War. I mean, during the Cold War, bipolarity was really two blocks that were separate and hardly connected with one another. I think that for all the talk of decoupling that we were talking about earlier, there's always going to be a degree of interdependence uh, in this new bipolar uh, world. There isn't going to be just the United States and uh, China. There's also going to be Europe. There are going to be other powers. So it's not going to be a kind of, you know, a replica of the Cold War, but based on... Ideo not, ideolo not, not ideologic. It will be more uh, commercial economic, uh, I mean, uh, environmental yeah, in, questions in, like this. Right? Exactly. In, in some areas, like indeed climate, there will need to be cooperation. In other areas, like defense or mm. uh, even digital, probably very little cooperation. I mean, those areas that are more connected to security are probably going to see a greater separation. Okay, then a few more questions, if you please. Uh, I would like to understand uh, the, uh, your view on the uh, mobility of the European Union. And if you uh, look back uh, when uh, everything started, uh, I've heard, read today again the speech of uh, Putin on, in Munich uh, in 2007, uh, when uh, actually he pronounced everything that he planned, he's gonna do. that he's going <laughs> to do, actually. Yes, no, nobody paid attention on this. This, and uh, do you think uh, it could happen if it wasn't European Union but different countries of Europe? Because uh, it started like economical union, then it be it became the, the real political, economical, uh, geopolitical union. So could it happen if it was separate countries? Could he win the attention of politicians and could throw all this money into different countries? And uh, uh, on the example of Great Britain that made uh, Brexit and now is very, very effective in helping Ukraine because it's uh, much more movable. So men never, they can do without all this bureaucracy. So they decided that they do it. So how movable and how free in the moves now European Union and will it change its bureaucratic basis that uh, uh, stops to do fast decisions? Well, I would say that, um, look, let me put it this way. It's an old colonial tactic, divide and rule. So it is very clear that if you are Russia looking at Europe, if you are China looking at Europe, you have an interest in Europeans being divided. If Europeans are united, there's a critical mass, strategic, economic, political, etc., power that makes it extremely difficult, basically, for uh, uh, an external adversary like Russia to, to divide you. So, you know, I think that for all the criticism that we may have of the European Union, it's slow, it's bureaucratic, it's cumbersome, but Thank goodness it exists, mm -hmm. because without it, uh, our security, not only our prosperity, but our security uh, would be, I think, very much imperiled. And indeed, you know, one only needs to look at what is happening in the United Kingdom these days to realize what an absolutely catastrophic decision Brexit was. 
Mm -hmm. I mean, that the chaos in, in this country, which makes my country uh, look almost stable, <laughs> I mean, it's absolutely incredible, um, you know, trying to put in place the kind of economic policy that Liz Truss had presented, inevitably, if you are small, quote unquote, United Kingdom, and you're not big European Union or big United States, you simply can't do that, basically. <laughs> Otherwise, you pay the kind of consequences that Liz Truss paid. Okay, it's an interesting question for uh, another discussion. Hopefully, we will have a chance to talk about it uh, later, just about this exact situation. But in the end, I want to ask you about Ukraine. Uh, sure, we understand we have to stop and win the war, stop it, finally. Then we have to reconstruct and rebuild Ukraine. It's a, that's a huge money. And uh, hopefully, it will be the reparation from the Russian uh, freezing uh, accounts uh, in the European banks or whatever and Europe will help to rebuild our country but my question is how Europe now from uh, observing how we struggle for our nation is Europe ready for strong new country in the, your union like Ukraine at what place Ukraine you are ready to give for us you know, I think that um, what is going to be um, fundamentally important, which is why I put so much emphasis on, uh, on Europe and on Ukraine-European relations, is that, you know, to the extent that Ukraine is a consolidated liberal democracy uh, and uh, a country that economically is, you know, will get back on its feet, is going to be a massive asset to the European Union. Now, it's not a foregone conclusion that this is going to happen. Um, it is considering that Russia is going to remain a threat even after the end of this war, uh, there is a risk of Ukraine remaining a hyper-militarized country. And a hyper-militarized country does not necessarily kind of go hand in hand with a liberal democracy. And given that Russia is going to remain a threat, the economic reconstruction is not going to be such a foregone conclusion. So I say all this simply to highlight the fact that in order to increase the chances of all of this happening, there needs to be, even before Ukraine is actually accepted in the European Union, there needs to be an accession process that delivers the benefits very early on in this process. Without it, Ukraine, I fear, will not be able to do it alone. It has to do it together with the European Union. Mm -hmm. I see. So uh, finally, you say you are not skeptics because I, uh, I I talked before with the your with the experts in, in politicians. I've heard a lot of skeptical points of view that uh, as long as uh, the war stops, uh, they more think that uh, the previous status quo will got back. So you are not skeptical. You are optimistic no, no, no. on this question. No, I'm I'm absolutely sure about this. I mean, uh, there's no going back to the past. The future is not necessarily rosy, but there's definitely not going back to the past. This is where, why I wanted to stress at the end of our conversation. I thank you very much for finding time for us. And for thank our, you. Thank you. For our audience, I uh, remind that uh, we were talking with Natalie Tochi, uh, director of the Instituto Affari Internazionali, and uh, the political scientist, and uh, hopefully we'll get a chance to talk more. Thank you. Thank you.